Welcome to Community Voices, Deltas Unite, urgent call for climate action with the United Nations Convention for Conserving River Deltas. Please mute yourselves if you can, because we want to make sure that we can hear everyone. We have people coming in from all over the world. On behalf of all the partners who are working on this convention, we are so pleased that you are able to join us for this important conversation. We have community voices from the Indus River Delta, the Niger River Delta, the Mekong River Delta, the Amazon River Delta, the Congo River Delta, and from Canada about their water issues. Our friends in the Middle East were not able to join us today due to travel, but they wanted me to let you know that they are eager to work with us in the future. While we know that we are only a small representation of all the river deltas in the world, we are beginning to assemble voices from all parts of our globe for this important work. I thought it would be important to share just a few facts from the United Nations about our current water situation. Only 0.5% of water on earth is suitable and available fresh water. And climate change is dangerously affecting that supply. Over a fifth of the world's basins have recently experienced either rapid increases in their surface water area, indicative of flooding, a growth in reservoirs and newly inundated land or rapid declines in surface water area, indicating drying up of lakes, reservoirs, wetlands, floodplains, and seasonal water bodies. All of this important information provided by the United Nations has motivated us to believe that with the right kind of knowledge, collaboration, focus on communities, youth, indigenous peoples, working together with scientists, water managers, and government agencies, we can bring the kind of focus, commitment, and ability to design the transboundary water systems that are needed to address the urgent problems we are facing. Not only are we gathering the smartest scientists in the world to address these problems, but we are committed to the community voices, which we will be hearing from today, who will need to lead the way in protecting our water sources and providing the access to clean water for everyone. Thank you all so much for participating. We hope that everyone will be able to join us from all over the world. So please be patient if some people were not able to come, but we know that many of you are here today. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Freeman Elohu, founder and center coordinator, <clears throat> excuse me, founder and center coordinator for African Center for Climate Actions and World Development, and our focal person for Deltas Unite, UNCCRD. Freeman? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Susan, for the opening this ceremony and the brief. And uh, I want to actually say a big thank you to everybody who is seated in the hall today. It's um, a long process that uh, has actually started with key partners that are doing this together. So we are hoping and uh, looking forward to working with other persons who are going to actually make our events and uh, whatever we're advancing to be very helpful. So sitting there, you are actually a key stakeholders in what we are doing. And uh, we also want to thank all the partners from the different parts of the world that are doing this. So I'm not gonna to take too much of our time here I'm just quickly going to just uh, throw a little bit uh, brief on what uh, Deltas Unite means and uh, where we are with uh, a new UN convention 
in order for us to see how we can start conserving our deltas. So first, um, why did we decide to come together on, on our deltas? One, uh, we know that uh, our deltas are key resource that actually cut across livelihood, also talked about climate change regulation, but all these are being threatened by climate change, human population increases and extractive activities. And if we continue to look at uh, the direction of the world today where COVID-19 has posed some huge challenges, our countries have become deficit and looking for ways to actually explore more called the blue, the, 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 the blue economy, our ocean, our waters are going to be in great danger. So when we talk about water, we are looking at access. Water access is one. Today, we don't have a unified water quality standard, and we don't have water quality to talk about portable water. A place like South Africa in 2015 was uh, rated in Cape Town and some other places today in Johannesburg inclusive. You, we hear things that um, water is no longer adequate in hotel. They put on the wall that please be careful with the amount of water you will use. So I was jokingly telling them in South Africa that in the next two, three, four, five years, when we get to South Africa, if you pay for a room, they are going to charge you for the room and they'll tell you that you are only assessed or allowed to use, to flush your toilet, maybe like two or three times. After that, the others you have to pay. So I was just kidding with that to just tell us the huge mess that, uh, they know we are in with water availability or portable or quality. Then we can look at the issue of flooding. Flooding is something that is cutting across. It happened in the United States. It happened in Germany. It took place in Nigeria that subdued massive community. For example, the communities are going to be stalking later. Bayelsa State, Yenegua. We had about uh, uh, seven local governments. Six was already in water, including the capital. So we had these same problems that lead a lot of community displacement. We have things resulting into migration. We are talking about losing our food systems, causing hunger and poverty. So this is why we came together to say no. Our Delta touches on the livelihood of not just the rich and also the poor. And poor people are mostly affected. And women and children are suffering a huge growth. So we came together and we are in the University of Vermont, University of Colorado, Bayelsa State uh, government in Nigeria, from Pakistan, and also looking at uh, the Pakistan Water Forum. We all came together, we approached the United Nations, and as I speak to you, the United Nations has accepted and said, yes, it is time for us to have a convention that protects the issues of the Delta. So we are very, very pleased to move this convention forward. And we are going to COP28, for example, to have a launch of this new convention in collaboration with the United Nations. So it has been recognized and it has been given some huge level of acceptance. And we are very well coordinated moving forward to see that this convention address issues of the Delta and the climate induced challenges we are facing globally. So this is not an issue of just our organization, or these are not issues of uh, looking at Pakistan or Nigeria alone. We are discussing issues that affect deltas across the world. So we are very, very happy to see you seated here to listen to conversation from the community perspective. And I'm very happy to share additional knowledge if you want us to have this conversation going forward. So thank you very much. I will thank you for being here and to be part of it. I hope that in the next conversation going forward, we'll be there physically to move this conversation in a more lighter manner. And we'll do this and have the UN get a, a proper approval and see benefit goes down. Thank you very much. And back to Asim. Asim. Freeman, uh, thank you so much for uh, these opening remarks. And of course, we'll be getting back to you as part of the Community Voices panel as well. Um, so I will be just uh, overviewing like the, the, the main um, aspect here is to understand that the deltas are not only by themselves 
uh, important, but they are also a connected part of the overall highlands to oceans in transboundary river systems. And we need to think about when we are in understanding the, the crisis and challenges being faced by deltas, that they are part of not only the global climate change induced sea level rise and saltwater intrusion, but it's also the glacial melt that's happening in the, in the glaciers. The whole water cycle is being affected by this. So in this case, for example, when we look at the transboundary Indus and Mekong river basins from, from where you will hear the community voices today, they're not only faces, facing glacial melt in the Tibetan highlands from climate change and rainfall variability, it's also the saltwater intrusion from the ocean facing, like the, 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 the uh, in the Indus Basin, for example, is a transboundary system between um, China, India, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. And when the glaciers are melting in the highlands, um, a, a lot of these dams are being put by the countries as a way to store the water in the highlands. That is leading to a loss of the environmental flows in the waters, fresh waters in the, in the downstream places, like in the south here in the Indus Delta. And this, this is the Delta region. But with the sea level rise, this delta is moving northwards. So the so the problem here is that uh, a lot of those uh, people who are living in the coastal regions are facing the consequences of uh, the, the facing the crisis and climate change induced forced migration is being put upon them, as we have seen in Bangladesh and the Mekong region, which is shown on the right hand side here, uh, where the tidal system and saltwater intrusion is making life difficult for the people to grow food. So we want to hear from the from the people from the community voices, people who are doing research and working with the communities there in today's panel. Uh, furthermore, when we look into, for example, there are inland deltas in the, as Susan mentioned, like in the Jordan River Basin, this is the Dead Sea. Uh, so there are also inland deltas or like the Aral Sea that are also part of the problem here, where they are evaporating with climate change and use. Uh, but at the same time, they're creating problems for the people and the communities who are living there. And we will be hearing today about those communities. Uh, similarly, the Amazon Basin, on, this is the Brazil has one of the largest deltas, uh, but but the communities who are being affected because of the climate change in the Andean mountains are as much uh, facing the consequences from what's happening in the delta than the downstream issues because of the uh, a lot of the migration that's taking place because of these issues. Um, similarly, in Niger Basin, you just heard from uh, Freeman, but also similarly in Congo Basin um, and in, in Nile Basin, Nile River, for example, where the Nile grows into the Alexandria region in the delta, uh, there are a lot of already consequences that are starting to happen um, that we are seeing across these systems. So a part of this work is that with the UN Convention, our goal is to not only look at, for example, these are the 60, 60 large, sorry, 40 large ocean facing deltas that span our planet, uh, but there are also later on in the science panel today, we will be talking more about what are the scientific challenges that are happening. So with that, I'm going to be handing this over uh, to the uh, the, the moderators for the Community Voices panel, I would like to introduce them to you. Uh, those are uh, Dr. Caitlin Wardick. Uh, she's uh, uh, done a PhD in um, uh, environmental planning and as a, uh, serving as a, a transboundary water in cooperation network fellow at the CAPA, at the Center for Advancement of Public Action at Bennington College. Um, and Liza McCombray, she's a, a, a PhD student in sustainable development policy, economics, and governance here at the University of Vermont. And very active. She comes from South Africa um, and has brought a lot of African voices uh, to the table here. Um, and then uh, on online, we have we are joined by Mariam Abbasi. Mariam is from Indus Basin, but also Transboundary Water and Cooperation Network Communications Coordinator and a core member of our team. Um, and then um, I think online we have uh, uh, Rachel, uh, sorry, um, Harriet. Uh, from in Environmental Peace Building, Harriet Ellis from Environmental Peace Building Association. Um, and she's also uh, the, the help, helping us with the coordination to Environmental Peace Building Association is one of our core partners. Um, that is, uh, this meeting is leading towards uh, part participation and some of the panels that we're organizing. So with that, I will be um, handing it over to the, Dr. Kevin Bardick and Liza to continue this discussion. Thank you. We're coming to you today from Uni University of Vermont in Burlington, Vermont, in the northeastern part of uh, uh, North America. And uh, UVM has a land acknowledgement, which I will read to you now. The campus of the University of Vermont sits within a place of gathering and exchange, shaped by water and stewarded by ongoing generations of indigenous peoples, in particular, the Western Abenaki. <laughs> Acknowledging the relations between water, land, and people is in harmony with the mission of the university. 
acknowledging the serious and significant impacts of our histories on indigenous peoples and their homelands as part of the university's ongoing work of teaching, research, and engagement, and an essential reminder of our past and our connected futures for the many of us gathered on this land. The University of Vermont respects the indigenous knowledge interwoven in this place and commits to uplifting the indigenous peoples and cultures present on this land and within our community. Next slide. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, thank you so much, everybody. I uh, just wanted to say welcome um, again to Echo Susan and Asim's um, words. Um, my job here, myself and Caitlin, is to also set out just a few sort of ground rules uh, or expectations. So I would like to create expectations for how the next hour and a half will proceed with regards to the community voices. So we are going to have six groups which are representative of the River Deltas. And in each group, we'll have short discussions um, amongst themselves but we'll first introduce all the, we are calling them facilitators or just in, um, you can see them as maybe team leaders of each group and we'll ask the facilitators to introduce their group members um, and keep time for their group. So how we will proceed is that uh, Caitlin will first introduce the facilitators of each of the six groups and then the facilitators will introduce their team members, and then we'll proceed. We expect that these uh, small group discussions to take about an hour, and then we'll open the floor for questions and comments, which will be 30 minutes. So all in all, making up the 90 minutes. So I hope the instructions are clear. We are going into the community voices session, which is 90 minutes, uh, broken down into three pieces. Caitlin's introductions of the facilitators, and then the group discussions, and then the question and answer session. So that's how this session will proceed. But um, welcome to everyone. And I feel so welcome. I'm in uh, the US, but I'm from South Africa, but I already had, I think it was Freeman talking about Cape Town. So I feel at home. Uh, I hope everyone is feeling the same too. Cape Town. Um, thank you. So each of our small groups is selected for their experiences with the river basin and is being facilitated by someone from that river basin. Our first group brings us to the Indus River Delta, um, and Senator Nisa Memon will introduce our speakers for the Indus River Delta. Um, Nisa Memon has vast public and private experience in many different leadership roles. He is the founding chairman of uh, the Water Environment Forum in Pakistan, um, and he has joined, uh, uh, he collaborates with uh, many prestigious national social development organizations working in the coastal areas of Sindh, um, and he is joined by uh, Mukhtar Mahar, and, uh, and, and he will introduce anyone speaking with him. Let me hand the floor over to you, Senator Memon. Mir Mon Baloch. Mir Baloch. And Mir Baloch. Oh, Mir Baloch is the third speaker in your group? Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning and good evening from Pakistan, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Freeman and Asim, for a very clear way forward and introducing and kicking off this whole session of today. And there has been a number of uh, work that has gone in by you people, and we are happy to join you. It's a pleasure to really be part of this global effort on United Nations Convention for Conserving River Deltas. I am joined in this session, as you heard, for the next 10 minutes by Dr. Mukhtar Malik, Mukhtar Maher from Sindh University, and Mr. Meer Baloch from the from the rural support centers from Tata. And in addition to that, there are other colleagues also who are attending, but in this session, uh, we will there be three of us equally dividing our three, three minutes so that we stay in time for 10 minutes. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, we held a dialogue with the Deltic community only on the 19th September, a couple of days back to apprise us of the most recent status of, to share with you since they are 
the community is very eager to get their views resolved under the proposed UN Convention to say what they call the dying Indus Delta. I shall briefly speak about global, regional, and national challenges voiced by the community, while other team members will share the district and delta issues. Challenges globally are seawater intrusion, coastal erosion, agriculture land degradation, degradation of the wetlands, deteriorating groundwater quality, with even arsenic and surface water pollution, which are caused mainly by the reduced water from upstream to downstream, diminishing river flows to delta, and eliminate and climate change with temperature rises. This has resulted in death and disasters, reduced livelihood, increasing health hazards, and painful migration. Ladies and gentlemen, Indus Delta is fifth or the largest uh, world delta. Sometimes I hear it's sixth, but whatever, it is one of the largest delta with seventh largest forest of mangroves, which is facing the challenges of climate change. Pakistan is least contributor contributing to the affected uh, uh, changes, but and with the temperature is one point minus 1.5 must be achieved to save all of us. Indus River water is shared under 1960 Indus Water Treaty with India and faces transboundary issues that uh, Asim pointed out, like water diversion, water releases, environmental flows, discharges to the sea from river, excessive groundwater pumping, and pollution. Subsequent to this 1960 water accord within the country of Pakistan, there was water apportionment agreement in 1992 amongst the provinces of Pakistan, and there has been a number of policies, coordination among all the chairs and the stakeholder coordination and some of the national challenges we are facing. Now, solutions proposed are simply to connect all the stakeholders, just like we are doing it right away, with focus on collaboration with at all levels, namely global, regional, national, and district, and I call it grand, by adopting the Delta Convention implementing COP15 Paris Agreement for containing temperature below minus 1.5 centigrade and action these 20, COP27 decisions have been taken on fund releases like loss and damage report, uh, fund. Ladies and gentlemen, to save the ecosystem, I recommend UN declares Indus Delta as World Heritage Region. Uh, this is something that we believe uh, we must put it into our recommendation. And now I will ask Dr. Meher to take the floor for the next three minutes. Dr. Meher. Uh, thank you very much, sir. I'm also very much grateful to this forum that gave me the opportunity to talk about the issues and challenges which we are facing at Indus Delta Ecoregion in uh, Sindh province of Pakistan. Sir, definitely, I also endorse your comments and your uh, this uh, discussion regarding the Indus River. Currently, uh, about 1 million population of uh, human beings are surviving, which are facing a number of uh, disasters, such as very recently we faced the Biparja cyclone at the Indus Delta Act region. We uh, evacuate a number of areas to Jawal and Chacha districts, where a large number of mangroves, large number of fish production, uh, uh, agriculture land also affected by these disasters. In the flood and heavy rains of 2002, too, we lost a lot of uh, a lot of livelihoods as well as our uh, our uh, loss of damages of the infrastructures as well as assets. So I must give the attention to this global community, scientific community, to please give the attention on these issues as we are facing the problems of climate change and coastal issues. Now we are turning to the uh, adapting to the saline water, saline uh, situation, because we are facing the sea intrusion, sea level rise, as well as shortage of the fresh water. It is well established fact that Indus River 
uh, also donate a number of constructions, man-made things such as dams, barrages, as well as canals, is growing population of Pakistan. So in this condition, the quarterly downstream of the Indus Delta are now currently receiving very lowest quantity of fresh water. Therefore, a lot of mangroves, fish production, our agriculture, our fertile land also very much damaged and affected. Now, we are at the stage to uh, give the attention from catching to the culture side. We are going to start artificial smart fish culture development. The uh, salt tolerant agriculture species, as well as the cultivation of the mangroves. In this connection, I am working on two major, pro uh, two major projects which are donated me by the district government, uh, which are establishment of the uh, uh, Marine Research Laboratory and Survey Unit at Sijawal and Tata. This survey unit also help in the research and future mitigations to face the problems and challenges of the current issues of the climate change, change as well as other factors. Now, currently, we are facing a lot of migration among the coastal communities due to the shortage of the livelihood and lack of education as well as the socio-economic incentives. We must give attention to our population. I also urge to the government of Pakistan as well as the global community to please give attention, strong attention to our Indus Delta because as per your comments and the literature says that the Indus okay. Delta region was the largest. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Maher. Sir. Thank you very much. Now I give the floor to Meer Baloch. Meer Baloch, please. Thank you, Dr. Maher. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Nisar Saab. And uh, um, uh, I am really thankful to all of you uh, for granting me an opportunity to take part in this intellectual discussion which may pave the way, the future for UNCCRD. Uh, as I am belongs from the Indus Delta, uh, I am belongs from the, uh, where, where Indus Delta is located. So I put my, uh, I, I share my, I, I'm, 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 I share uh, the actual situation of the, uh, the people of the Indus Delta. Uh, Indus Delta really, which is now almost of life left Delta, as Nisar Saab already said, this has particularly severe impacts on the local indigenous people and their livelihoods. Historically, the Indus Delta was a prosperous part of the Pakistan. But over the last six decades, it has slowly and uh, gradually deteriorated due to the both man-made and the natural disasters. Considering this, the National Disaster Management Authority of Pakistan has classified that the district Thatta is the most vulnerable deltic district of the country. According to the Sindh government figures, out of the 43 revenue villages of Kalka County Bandar of the coastal district of the Sindh province, 30 have been completely eroded and encroached upon by the sea. Similarly, poverty is a serious issue in the coastal sin, especially in the Delta area, with 80% population living below the poverty line, out of which 54% are poor of the poorest. In addition to a lack of income opportunities, and poor access to the government services, specifically health and education and communication. Coastal households must cope with the rapidly declining environmental conditions. The most important livelihood of poor and indigenous people of the Indus Delta is under the threat. Crop cultivation is threatened by the saline intrusion in, uh, into fresh water sources and unseasonal rains and disasters, aquatic products and fish collection from the coastal ecosystems such as mangroves and mud fields are threatened by over exploitation and coastal erosion. 
regular losses of livelihoods is pushing vulnerable group further into the cycle of poverty considering this situation we are grateful to all of you including the indus delta in its restoration efforts and conservation efforts the restoration of indus delta will bring about the significant change in the area and specifically it's a very much beneficial for the coastal communities thank you very much Thank you very much, uh, Meet Baloch. Now, in closing, I will uh, before I close, I will uh, like to recognize uh, uh, Water Environment Forum and other friends in Pakistan, Dr. Raghav Shah, who is also as a participant, and then Dr. Ashraf is there. And I'm very happy to see that the Associated Press of Pakistan, which provided the coverage to our local event, is uh, now attended by Ali Jabba. Uh, from the APP. So thank you all, gentlemen. Now, in closing, I'll only say you must have seen the co commonalities of the Indian Delta with other deltas and islands. Thus, the solutions must be shared among them all. Let's also heed to what the UN Secretary General said only yesterday, uh, and I quote, humanity has opened the gates to help, warns the guterus as climate coalition demands action. Thank you so much indeed. Over to you. Thank you so much. That was lovely. I hope we manage the time well. Right. <laughs> but um, we will be available for all the questions that may come in later on. Thank you. Okay. So, um, uh, we have uh, several more groups of speakers and then we're going to take questions. Um, and our next group is a group of people who are working in the Niger River Delta. Uh, and uh, the person leading that group of speakers is Freeman Elahor. He works with the, uh, um, he's the founder and center coordinator for the African Center for Climate Actions and Rural Development in Nigeria, Accord. And he will introduce our other speakers. Uh, Freeman, you're keeping time about 10, 12 minutes uh, for your group. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Go ahead. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, um, our speakers from Pakistan, and uh, for dealing properly with the issues in that region. So without uh, taking much of our time, I will want to introduce uh, our speakers from uh, the Nigeria Niger Delta. So we have um, a balance of gender between uh, Reynos and uh, Rebecca is a community expert who have actually worked on issues around the Delta and um, they quite understand some of these challenges. So I will want to first of all bring in uh, Reynos. No, Reynos, are you there? And Rebecca? Yes, if I'm you... here. Okay, that's fine. Rebecca, are you there? Rebecca, if you are there, please unmute yourself. Then uh, I was thinking I wanted to bring you in first. So let's first of all bring in Reynos. Reynos, we have about 12 minutes to do this. So you are going to speak to it about, if you can use about five to six minutes, that's fine. So these are experts who work more with the Akasa Development Foundation. It's a community group in Bayelsa State. And uh, they understand some of the issues on the ground and also develop models. So we want you to give some court crossing issues, not just in Bayelsa State, but it should be similarity of the data issues across the Niger data. So Reynolds, can, can we hear from you while we double check on uh, Rebecca? Reynolds, over to you, please. Yeah, thank you, Freeman, and every other person that's it did. Uh, I've been introduced very well. I am talking to you directly from uh, the place of incident uh, in Akasa, uh, Brazil, Geobias State, um, as one of the areas that are uh, going through what every other person has been explaining. Um, Akasa is at the far south of Nigeria, and then we are going through a whole lot of climate change activities and all of that. So 
Um, we are happy to be part of the Delta Unite and want to share uh, some of our um, experiences and perhaps what we are doing to uh, keep ourselves going um, as we um, await other interventions as regards uh, the issue of climate change and the Niger Delta. Okay, firstly, um, I want to say Nigeria, um, Niger Delta, it's uh, um, going through a lot of them, a lot of issues, and part of the issues like we have in the areas of erosion, uh, we have the issues of a sea surge, and the coastal flood, and even the inter flood that we get from up north, but Shindan from the Niger. And then um, our own case is particularly different because we have this annual flooding, so we don't have the hurricanes and others that affect other people, but here we have the annual flood and that of the erosion that washes away communities. And so we are also looking at a way to support those interventions. First, what we do was to look at a possible way to support uh, and to tell our own story uh, because we are far from the city center. So it will be difficult for people to hear actually what we're doing. So um, in the Niger Delta, particularly in, in Biasa State, we uh, go to schools and educate them concerning the problems we are having uh, so that they also can intervene, um, not so scientific, but to have the understanding of the issues that we are facing. And so we, from time to time, take inventory of what happens on the beach and then see the impact of what we are doing. So communities get to be aware and then schools get trained on certain ways to support the environment and report on uh, nature-based activities like disaster. And then so we work with local stakeholders because what we are doing here, we support what come up um, because it's difficult actually to go up to meet with um, the government to respond almost immediately. We work uh, directly with the community people, um, participatory engagement, so that we try to get support from the local stakeholders. We try to build the stories and expand to the government through advocacy for collective participation. So these interventions actually has helped us to tell our own stories at the state, uh, national, and at the global um, level. Because one of the interventions we look into, because we are in a place that have a whole lot of uh, natural resources, like the mangrove that every president has mentioned, um, and other biodiversities and the coastal species like sea turtle that we are conserving and other birds, we are keen in making sure that our beaches are not completely washed off according to the uh, solutions we have in other areas. So. We try to spread this information so that more persons in the local areas can get engagement. Last year, 2022, in Biasa State, we had a deadly flood that uh, resulted to uh, migration of a lot of persons, uh, destruction of lives, and even properties. And what we did was to take uh, a local inventory of what is happening so that we can help escalate and tell um, um, stakeholders and what is being done. So this local intervention work with persons is what we believe in um, at this level. Now, a lot of things uh, potentially is, is, is not going well because uh, every day um, knowledge is increasing and we needed to have uh, something like community scientists that will be on ground um, to be able to take records of those things. And one thing is to take records and other thing is to see how those records have been escalated. So I think it is important to see that this uh, Delta Unite is being produced to be able to cover uh, those lapses we have. Then, um, so all of these issues that I've mentioned okay. is, is you know, you have about 30 area. seconds, please. please. So all, all of these things I mentioned are common in this area. So maybe I will pass it to um, Rebecca if she's on to further spread what I've said. Thank you so much. Rebecca, please. Okay. This is Rebecca, as I introduced Rebecca Papa from Akasa Development Foundation. 
I'm glad to be among this meeting. I want to continue from where Reynolds stopped, like the challenges of the Niger Delta River. And we have like the flooding, we have the erosion, and we have the local devastation of our environment. And this flooding from the river Niger causes overflow, overflow to the communities from the Niger River. And when this flooding comes, it causes so many havocs in the communities. Like the similarity is the same in the whole of the Niger Delta. Is it the coastal? People stay living in the coastal communities and the inland communities. Like when this flooding comes, it affects this yearly flooding, it affects the community, the farmlands, the fishing system, and every other activities of the social activities it affects. And when it happens, women are more vulnerable to these activities of this flooding. Because this flooding affects even the drinking water. When this flooding comes, it affects the borehole of so many communities. Like I was a witness to the 2023, 2022 uh, flooding, even in River State, where the, river, uh, the East West Road cut off into two. And it becomes difficult for foods to go to the various communities. And there was no way motor could pass to the other states, even between Wari and Bayasa states. So people suffered so many hungers. People are forced to uproot their crops, mostly cassava from the farms, and the pressure on them to finish their farms. And most of them lost their farms to the floods, and it caused hunger. And women, we are transferred, mostly women, we are transferred to the IDP camp, which causes so many disease, infection, affects their health. And you know, women, when it comes to their monthly period, it is a terrible thing how they could make, because they sleep in the same hall mixed up with men. So it was a serious danger to the health and the environment. And this flooding is not only the early flooding, also the rain flooding. The rain flooding, when it comes, because of the erosion, so the soils, many soils have washed away and it affects the living condition of the people. When the rain falls heavily, it enters into people's houses and they are forced to leave their places of abode and which is affecting them seriously. Like two weeks ago in Ahuda, a member of my church couldn't come to church. I asked her, what is the problem? She said, she's bailing water out of her house and they cannot pass waste because the water through this, uh, the septic tank have entered into the toilet. So this climate change is very terrible and affecting the people of the Niger Delta. Like in the case of Akasa, where I come from, you see when this flooding comes, the erosion comes, this yearly flooding and the flooding in general comes, most people, the low income earners, they take their drinking water from the dog to well. And when this flooding comes, it affects the well where they get water from. And there, there will be no water for them to drink and they will wait until the water ebbs away. And you can imagine the death which this flood have packed into the dirty, into the dugout well already. So it affects their health, rashes, malaria, all kinds of sickness. And many communities have lost their lands and their properties. Like when you come, I'm talking about the Niger Delta as a whole. When you come to like the Orashi area of the Niger Delta, most low-income people, they live on mud, house, mud houses. And when this flooding comes, you can imagine how it affects the house. And they will, these houses will live inside water. You will not even see the roof. And after the flood, all these houses will fall. And it, and it affects the condition of living, the living condition of the people. It's terrible. And hunger, because they've lost their farms, mostly in this northern, in this southern part of Nigeria. Uh, we live on 
this baked curry and it becomes scarce during this flood period. Foods and many things. And I say women are affected most because women are in charge so, of the best. Rebecca, can, can you just round up in 30 seconds, please? Okay, okay. So okay. I'm talking in general erosion and every other, this erosion, flooding, and the local devastation is a terrible thing. Makes people lost their houses. Even in Akasa as a whole, you see this is such. We have lost so many communities, so many houses to the river. Sangana, oh, Fish, oh. Tikiri, oh, and all. Thank, thank, thank you very much, uh, Rebecca, for actually proving to us that uh, women has a lot of capacity not just to identify some of the challenges, but also to provide some of the solution. And you're doing that with uh, Akasa Development Foundation. And uh, this is uh, one key example we want to actually draw on to save that local community, they are not just only the most affected, but they also have solutions that they can contribute, which is why in Deltas Unite and the United Nations, the new convention on conserving river Delta, we found out that the roles of local community, those people who suffer mostly, must be reflected. So, which is why this convention uh, objective is to give local community people a similar voice to sit down at the UN or sit down with their government. Every other convention actually allow the government of these nations to negotiate. But USCC ROD, which is United Nations Convention on Conserving River Delta, provide opportunities and privileges for local community to be on the same table discussing their problems. So it's very nice, and we're looking forward to pushing this and inputting in some community displacement, migration for survivor. So we should know that people in the Delta no longer move from, it's no longer a migration from rural to urban, it is migration for survival. You need to live and go to other places to survive. We talked about their human health implications. And also, it is also important to let you know that because of climate change and these flooding issues and climate change concerns, there is increasing use of chemicals in farming and also bringing a lot of farm losses and conflict. So if you look at this issue together, it goes to let you know that there is need for us to be part of this new convention, advancing it, which is why this event has been put together to get more community voices. So thank you very much. Over back to those in the house moderating the event. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Freeman. And that last issue about chemical use speaks to my, my most uh, urgent concerns. Um, uh, our next uh, group of speakers is uh, works with then the Mekong River Delta. Uh, we're going to be led in a discussion uh, by uh, Bakhtan Sin. Um, he, is a, he works at the University of Social Sciences and Humanities at the Institute of Policy and Management at Hanoi National University in Vietnam. And he is joined by Dr. Ho Phu Luc. Um, you have about 10 minutes. Uh, thank you. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for giving us uh, a chance to share with you uh, some topic that we're talking about uh, too much water and then too little water. And the title is uh, From Living with Flood to Living Without Flood in the Mekong Delta. The presentation prepared by myself and then uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Tuan, who could not make it uh, in the last minute. And so, uh, uh, <clears throat> I just uh, want to uh, provide you some kind of a uh, quick uh, background uh, of the, the issue that we discussed uh, from how the 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 the, the, youth, the people in the Mekong Delta are dealing with the challenge of uh, from uh, living with flood to living with our real flood uh, by uh, my colleague uh, Dr. Lok uh, for uh, one of the case study he can share uh, uh, from his his research. So. So firstly, you can see uh, the Mekong Delta is the, the, the biggest agriculture and aquaculture production of Vietnam, and it supplies more than 50% of rice and 65% of fish for the country. And uh, it's covered around 40,000 kilometers, uh, and this is uh, about 7 million, about 20% of the total population of Vietnam and covered 12 provinces. And, uh, 
this is the uh, 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 area which the uh, rich, uh, rich uh, biodiversity is considered the, uh, one of the largest wetland in the country, which is very flat and low. This land is a high lake biodiversity and very sensitive to an ecological characteristic. So we uh, discussed you know, how to live with flood uh, as uh, we consider that uh, the flood uh, happened in the Mekong Delta from the, the three major sources. Firstly, 60% uh, of this coming from the upstream, 30% uh, coming from uh, the East Sea River, 10% uh, from the rainfall, and when uh, it is come uh, together at the same time, it's uh, will create a, a major issue. And uh, the nature of the flood uh, in the Mekong Delta is uh, is uh, considered uh, uh, quite uh, uh, disastrous and, and uh, quite uh, um, uh, high impact. Uh, and I can uh, share with you some of the features. So, for example, uh, in the uh, 2002, uh, in the 2000, we've uh, experienced a severe flood with the uh, result of 500 deaths, 5 million uh, people affected, and 60,000 evacuated. And it's uh, they made about uh, 200, uh, uh, 800 uh, houses. So, uh, and uh, the, the, the most of the damage uh, is. Uh, 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 during this uh, in 2000, uh, it's considered about uh, the same figure like uh, 760 house uh, are submerged and something like this. So I would like not to, get to go into detail, but just give you a, uh, an idea of what is the, the major impact uh, of the um, flood uh, is happened in the in the in the in the past. And uh, we can see this fact also uh, occur in the in the Kanto is one of the city in the in the center of the Mekong uh, River, went there. But uh, uh, we're talking about uh, flood uh, mostly from the hazard, but the flood can be uh, considered from the benefit, and that's uh, uh, considered by the field of many farmers uh, as uh, not the enemy as uh, even uh, wanted. And why? Because they provide the uh, following uh, benefit first to provide supply to fish and bring uh, plant corn for the fishes. Second, to catch a uh, snake, rat, snail, and pick the uh, vegetable, to supplement the sedimentation, to uh, rust the toxins from the acid uh, sunflower soil, to reduce the uh, salinity insertion, and to kill insects, and uh, to avoid uh, to, uh, to ground storage, uh, storage and to raise the water table. So that's also uh, other uh, uh, benefit uh, from uh, the flood. Uh, is this uh, something during the flood uh, the people can have uh, additional uh, uh, income like uh, handicraft uh, uh, from uh, uh, dried uh, water high hardship uh, or macro aquaculture by the poor uh, living in the resident cluster. And this is also other big benefit, uh, including uh, tourism uh, with uh, uh, what we call now uh, ecotourism and in Lysic. And uh, why we, we think that the, 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 the disaster is quite a uh, a dialect, a dialect, a dialect a link between the living with flood, the notion, and the, the pattern of the natural, uh, natural resource uh, usage. If the flood uh, land is mainly used for the rice cultivation, then the flood is rather disaster than benefit. But if the flood land is used for integrated and multi purpose development uh, objective, such as aquaculture, forest plantation, improvement of environment and tourism, then the flood is even the tip provided by the major nature. Now we live, uh, we live in, uh, moving from the living with the flood to living with uh, our flood, which is uh, occurred, uh, recently occurred, especially with the uh, uh, the drought uh, uh, last uh, drought over the last few years. And uh, uh, you can see the in the region is climate change and sea level rise uh, are the major challenge in the Mekong Delta, and it's coming from different sources. And uh, in this, uh, uh, you can see uh, it's coming from different sources and. Uh, uh, I can uh, give you some uh, figures about uh, what kind of characteristic of the 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 the, the risk, and the, the this is uh, some of the the, the effect is uh, for example uh, more than one thousand one hundred uh, site has collapsed, eighty thousand hectare of the garden were the damage, uh, many uh, oyster aqua, uh, aquaculture uh, or aquaculture is is it collapsed. 
about 96,500 years like the domestic uh, water, more than 160,000 hectares of abundant land. And this is uh, something that we can see uh, the, the major uh, impact uh, uh, coming from uh, the result of the dry and sunny city uh, in the year 2020. And this is also, and you can see this, uh, uh, the, the very serious uh, soil erosion uh, happening in the subsidence uh, in some part of the Mekong Delta. And you can see this is uh, appear in, in the picture. And uh, this is uh, something we also uh, uh, experience with the increasing uh, sanity institution in the Mekong Delta. And uh, there's uh, some uh, map of the salt, salt, salt water institution uh, forecast in, in the Mekong Delta in the 2020, uh, compared to the sanity border in the 2000 and 2016. And we can see this is um, the, the, the issue of uh, uh, sanitary institution became a major issue in the Mekong Delta. And uh, there's uh, also another side of, uh, of uh, the, 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 the landslide port in, in the Mekong Delta. And uh, uh, to uh, see uh, what is the solution, the cost for the dry sanitary issue. It's coming from different sources. It's uh, firstly the uh, the uh, flat water reservoir work and uh, rainwater and storage uh, item. You can see also uh, something uh, is uh, dealing with the uh, uh, rice and cash crop uh, to transform uh, to the aquaculture. It's also dealing with the ability of nature uh, natural water absorption and storage water in the mangrove. Uh, uh, area is also related to exploitation of uh, restricted of the uh, groundwater or artificial supplement of the groundwater. And uh, there's a uh, kind of different way or to uh, uh, manage the water sources. Uh, uh, for example, the, in the picture, you can see uh, there's a, a number of uh, local initiatives uh, dealing with how can they uh, localize, uh, local, uh, locally uh, manage the, the water resources uh, more effectively. And also the other issue of uh, the, the, the recovery of natural water uh, absorption in the storage uh, nature in the micro uh, area. And uh, that sounds like something that just to leave, give you a, a bit proud about this uh, issue of uh, from the living with, with flood to living uh, with flood and uh, Michael Licklock uh, uh, provides you a, a very specific uh, case study. He, he did it uh, recently telling about the different, different kind of adaptation Measure uh, initiated by the local community in the Mekong Delta. Now, I think the floor is your uh, Dr. Lok can, can share with us, please. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you very much, Dr. Shen, uh, for your very insightful sharing. And it captures very well what has been happening in the Mekong Delta, the third world's largest. Um, I would not say it's a case study, it's more of adding on to what you have been saying. So, uh, Dr. Shen, may I um, share my screen a little bit? Yeah, please. Okay, now I stop sharing now. Yeah, please. yeah so we'll just. Uh, uh, let me make sure that I share the correct one. Okay. Um, so this is um this is a series of figures uh, that uh, from my uh, published papers to add, to add on. So first, let's talk about like why we have the living with flood uh, to living without flood. Uh, so basically in the Mekong Delta, and I, I think this is quite a unique feature of the Mekong Delta, is that we have a dike system. So the dike system has a history. Uh, why we have a dike system is because uh, during the Doi mine, or the renovation, uh, the government has pushed a lot of uh, emphasis on the rice, uh, not not only to make us uh, uh, less hungry, but also become a strategic uh, social economic development. So as you can see here in these pictures, this dye system to protect the uh, petty fields uh, from the flood. Okay, uh, but uh, what I have observed recently is because of the river mining. Uh, then the flood frequency uh, reduces significantly. So if you look at the graph on this side, you see that the horn um, here, we call it Long Sing Quadrangle, it's on the upper part of the Mekong Delta. Uh, we have basically less flood. Is the later period is on the red uh, histogram and the white is on the uh, blue diagram. So between 1995 to 2005 and after 2005, the frequency and also the area of flooded decreases significantly. So this is the root cause of what Dr. Shin has said. Now the farmers have been shifting to living without flood and being having to be protected by the dike. Now, uh, what to do with, with, with the dike is already in place. So that brings a very interesting question. 
Uh, so coming up here, you can see that I did uh, quite a bit of investigations to see the flood frequency reducing significantly in the upper part of the Mekong Delta. Uh, okay, so in the wet season, we have basically less days uh, where uh, the paddy fields is being flooded. Uh, so now, uh, why it is important to acknowledge that uh, living without flood uh, significantly changed the livelihood. Uh, so if you look here, uh, so for those of you uh, not familiar with the Mekong Delta, uh, I prepare a diagram. So basically, uh, during the flood season, Season, uh, the water will enter into the floodplain. This floodplain is also a, a paddy field. So why this is important is not only because it cleanses the agrochemicals uh, that the farmers put in place in the previous crops, but they can also bring in the new sedimentation to refertilize the refertilize the, the, the paddy fields. However, in recent years, first of all, we have the upstream dams that have been blocking a lot of sediment. Secondly, we have the uh, riverbed mining. So if you imagine uh, before, this is the mean water level. Later on, we have this mean water level. So why is that? It's because of the dredging of the riverbed. So now the processing drops. So for the same amount of discharge, the water level is decreased. So when it decreases with the semi die in place, the floodplain won't be flooded anymore. So the, the, the person are basically, the farmers are now dealing with uh, less flood. So then we, we look at how it changes uh, throughout the year. So if we you look at, at one case studies, uh, again, in uh, one area, you see that uh, the uh, crop plants also change significantly. So in the areas where before they can do the triple crop, you see, can do the triple crop, now they already reduces and then they can only do with only two crops. And this is on the uh, area where they still have enough of more or less enough water uh, for the um, rice and paddy fields. But on the coastal side, where we've been in the older days, they have the upstream flood uh, to fight off the, the salinity. Now they don't have flood. They don't have that source of water anymore. So there is a transition towards a, a rice and brown rotation of crops. And at the coastal zones, they already completely shifted into the aquaculture. So this adds on to some of my uh, very primitive observations of how the farmers in the Mekong have been able to adapt uh, to these two scenarios, living with flood and living with a flood. Uh, so with this, I return the floor back to Dr. Shun. Thank you very much. Thank you for your uh, very uh, uh, interesting uh, elaboration of uh, how the uh, the various uh, adaptation measure has been uh, carried out uh, in Vietnam, uh, depending on the the the, the, the issue that uh, we build the dike uh, to protect or uh, fully uh, dike uh, with the protected uh, the flat and uh, semi dike to uh, protect flat uh, just to a certain extent uh, and let the water come in, and this is something that we can. Uh, Share with you later when we come to the, the final uh, final uh, discussion of uh, how this is uh, considered as a kind of a, a new way of uh, uh, initiative, a, a voice of the local community to come up with their own adaptation measure to uh, cope with this kind of risk uh, associated with uh, living without flood. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, those were our speakers from the Mekong River Delta uh, coming to us from Vietnam. And we just wanted to acknowledge the Zoom bombing and, and we were able to take care of this intrusion quickly. Thank you to our moderators. If you don't know about Zoom bombing, you can look it up on your own. <laughs> um, and we've cut it out of the recording. Um, our next speaker is from Canada. Uh, she is uh, Dr. Diana Rice. Uh, she works in Montreal at Dawson College and in peace and social justice initiatives at the Peace Center in the Office of Sustainability. Uh, Diana, are you here and ready to speak? Let's see. Yes. Great, I'll take give you the floor. You have about, about 10 minutes. Thank you. I'll probably take a little bit less today because unfortunately the two wonderful young ladies who are gonna uh, join me from the community of Ghanawage were unable to come due to um, school conflicts and school comes first. So, um, but I will be um, taking their notes and, and sending it to, to the conference uh, organizers so that you have their additional thoughts. So my name is Diana Rice and I am coming to you from the unceded territories of the Ghanige Haga, um, members of the Six Nation Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Um, I am a settler, I'm a third generation settler of French, uh, Irish, Welsh ancestry on one side and sixth generation on my, my other side. So, 
Um, I'm coming from Canada and water issues have long been, very long been, um, water rights and water issues in Canada have been a long-standing issue for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is we have some the largest body of fresh water in the world when it comes to lakes. Um, we also have multiple deltas that are of critical importance to our lakes. Um, amongst them, we have the Saskatchewan River Delta, the, Mac uh, the Mackenzie and Saskatchewan uh, Deltas, as well as the Peace Athabasca Delta, or the Peace Athabasca and Birch River, where the Peace Athabasca and Birch Rivers meet. And we also have the St. Lawrence. Now, the St. Lawrence technically doesn't doesn't meet all of the criteria for ge geographically when you talk about a delta, but the St. Lawrence, which I will speak more about um, now, or like in this moment, um, is critical because it connects to the Great Lakes. And the Great Lakes are critically important for North America largely. And so when we talk about the St. Lawrence, we're not just talking about Canadian issues, but we're actually talking about North American um, concerns. So when it comes to the, um, the St. Lawrence, in Canada, we have the maritime provinces that are most effect, uh, that are affected. So we have Newfoundland, PEI, or Newfoundland, Labrador, PEI, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick. We also have Quebec and Ontario. And then we have many, many, many states in the United States that are also um, affected by this because of uh, the Great Lakes. Now, um, as has been echoed by many folks before me, um, flooding, habitat destruction, um, and concerns of net water um, in the Great Lakes because of um, the St. Lawrence and the rising of the ocean um, is, are one of the biggest concerns, right? Uh, this also obviously includes potability of water as well. Um, historically, there has been a lack of a comprehensive community and government strategies. Um, often we are plagued with governments and communities not being able to work together effectively and having long-term strategies when it comes to flooding. And in fact, I would say that in most provinces, the case frequently is that communities find themselves in a responsive um, situation where they're responding to floods rather than having preventative long-term measures um, that are coming together and, and using community concerns and needs. Uh, and, and being supported by their either municipal, provincial, or federal government. So that's like a, um, one of the challenges that we have, especially in Canada, is being able to have like comprehensive strategies that look to the communities and, and their needs, and then also uh, collaboration between those multiple sets of governments, which are obviously very, very challenging. Um, when it comes to flooding, obviously this causes massive uh, precarity when it comes to housing. So many, many people over the past, I would say, decade um, are slowly seeing the erosion of um, coastlines, especially, and they're seeing homes are becoming um, more and more imperiled, and more and more people every year are starting to lose homes and not being able to necessarily rebuild um, along the coastal the areas of either the Great Lakes or in the St. Lawrence um, River because of the massive amount of flooding. Um, this also has impacts on large scale fishing, but also on small fishers, right? And so while um, the, the fishing industry as a whole and large uh, large fishers are, are seeing the effects, uh, small mom and pop fisheries um, and indigenous fish, uh, fishers are having a really serious time with the depletion of, of fish stocks um, and the challenges that come with unpredictable weather, as well as flooding. Um, and the rise of acidification and the warming so that the fish stocks themselves are changing, right? What is available there for them. Um, when it comes to the, the stakeholders, they're broad, again, because we're talking about not just Canadian stakeholders, but also in the United States as well, right? So we're talking about local communities that are coming, local settler communities, right? So folks who are coming uh, from elsewhere who, whose families don't come from Turtle Island or North America. Um, but then also Indigenous communities are always on the front line, are almost always on the front line of all of this. Um, indigenous communities throughout Canada have been some of the biggest water protectors and have on their own done a lot of climate action, but they're also almost always the very first to be affected and the most negatively affected and the least supported. And so one of the biggest challenges beyond getting government uh, a comprehensive strategies between communities and governments and ensuring that those communities are um, being listened to effectively in their needs, the 
likely single biggest problem we have is environmental racism and systemic racism when it comes to indigenous communities and relig- uh, racialized communities within Canada because they do not receive equitable and uh, equal levels of resource and attention from the governments. So um, very commonly settler communities, particularly white settler communities will often receive more assistance post flooding or some level of preventative measures as compared to indigenous communities. And therefore they're often left out to figure things out for themselves. Um, And in cases where indigenous communities have tried to enact climate action. And so we can see that all across Canada, not just in St. Lawrence. Um, So one of the more famous uh, disputes that are going on right now is out West um, with the Wet'suwet'en and the Coastal Gas Link Pipeline that is scheduled to go through a whole bunch of different territory, but then also it would end at the Pacific Ocean um, where there's deep concerns about that. And the land or the water protectors, and it goes through many, many, um, uh, it goes through a whole variety of two different provinces and many, many different um, mountain passes, salmon rivers, and it transects numerous indigenous communities as well. It's about 670 kilometers, um, this pipeline. And it's and the folks who have been working towards stopping it or alerting folks to the dangers of having this, um, um, especially in conjunction with unpredictable weathers and with the flooding that is going on in this area as well, because of rising rising uh, temperature, uh, rising water levels because of the, the melting of the Arctic and the glaciers in the Arctic, um, they have actually been criminalized. And so one of the bigger um, challenges is being able to get stakeholders together in a way, especially when it comes to indigenous communities, that doesn't in- a- a include the criminalization of folks um, who are working towards climate action when it comes to water. And so it is not uncommon for um, police forces uh, to arrest and detain Indigenous folks um, who are trying to work on these kinds of issues. And so if we're going to look at, you know, stakeholders and the the most critical pieces when it comes to water security, um, water potability, uh, and all of the climate action issues when it comes to water and water security within Canada, the one of the largest problems we have is the federal government being unable to work collaboratively, peacefully, um, and without conflict with Indigenous communities, who, again, who are really on the forefront of this. And they have continuously criminalized folks who are trying to do the right thing, who have the knowledge, who understand the waterways much better than than we have, because they their families and their ancestors have been here for well over 10,000 years, right? And so they have so much knowledge that we could gain from, but instead, the government is far more concerned about um, overriding treaty obligations um, and criminalizing those who are working towards making significant change. Um, I guess the last thing before I I, I hand it back over to everybody else um, is that we also will see because of flooding inward immigration, right? Uh, Or migrant, not immigration, but migration um, of our coastlines because we have a lot of coastal areas in Canada, as is in the United States. And so as the water temp, as water um, rises, we're going to see the loss of many communities as a result of that, right? Um, Again, across Canada, because we are surrounded by the Pacific, the Atlantic, and the Arctic Oceans. And um, so so by virtue of this, we are going to see a lot of inland migration over the next hundred years because there are going to be so many places within Canada that are unsustainable. And at present, we do not have governments that are using, uh, that are forethinking. They're not um, prévoy, uh, they're not, um, sorry, my, my French brain and my English brain are, um, they're, they're, they're not seeing forward, they're not projecting forward to what we need to do in preventative measures for communities. Um, we're really still in a place of response to what is happening. Um, and there's also a lack of agreement, which again, in the United States, we can see too, um, a lack of agreement between our governments about the necessity of climate change action and whether or not it is something that we need to be dealing with in, in important ways. So thank you very much. Um, and I really appreciate this opportunity to have a, a, little, a chance to talk about our area in Canada as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so we heard from speakers from the Indus Delta, the Niger River Delta, the Mekong, 
and uh, from the St. Lawrence, St. Lawrence uh, River Delta uh, that borders Canada and the United States. So um, we are planning for a, a question answer period right now, and then a break at 45 minutes after the hour, which for you all in Pakistan would, I think is 7.45 PM and 9.45 PM for you all in Vietnam right now. Um, so uh, that we have about uh, 20, uh, 30 minutes for questions. And we thought we'd take uh, a, a question in person and then another one online and then give that to our panelists, uh, the, the two of them together. And let's see what our panel, how our panelists want to respond to the two questions or comments taken together. Um, uh, so uh, at least, is there anyone from who's in person right now, please raise your hand, who would like to uh, either give a question to one of our panelists or make a comment about what one of our panelists has said? Um, I, I think I can um, just, I just wanted to highlight just some common themes that have been coming uh, out of the, the discussions um, around uh, migration, like migration was one of the things that everyone spoke about. So to maybe ask the panelists to uh, speak a little bit more, I think there was one particular, um, I think it must have been Senator Nisa, if I'm not wrong, who, who defined um migration and someone else in a slightly different way where we are seeing the impacts of um climate change on on migration so maybe a little bit on exactly what's happening at the community level when um someone said you know people are migrating for survival i think i heard that what does that look like? Just to share a little bit of more information on that. Um, I think it's one phenomena where we need a lot of understanding as researchers, as uh, community activists and so on. <clears throat> so I think that that would be my, um, if I could hear a little bit more from the um, uh, panelists. And there's, and there's another question. Okay. Um, okay. Let, yeah. Let's hear from, uh, from Mir Mariam. Mariam, will you speak uh, on behalf of the question or comment in the audience? Someone has raised their hand. Raised their hand. Oh. Okay. okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, uh, would you like me to read question and comment first, or would you like to take a question of Ashraf, whose hand is raised first? Ashraf first. Let's take Ashraf first. Sure. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for this addressing this very important uh, topic of the uh, dying delta. And we have seen from the presentation, there is a lot of uh, uh, commonalities uh, in those uh, deltas. Uh, but we time and again talk about uh, uh, the reduction in flow in the deltas. And uh, we attribute all miseries of the deltas to the reduction in flow. With the climate change and with also with the uh, increase in population, there is a trade-off between the food security and also the, you know, uh, the environment and the and the deltas. Uh, I, I am curious to know from the speakers, the learner speakers, uh, is there any other option rather than uh, demanding for water, more, more water uh, for the deltas? Is there any other option that can help to sustain these deltas uh, with less water, relatively with less water? Thank you very much, over to you. Um, Thank I, you, uh, Ashraf. I think, I think you guys uh, will refer to uh, speakers later on. Do you want me to read an uh, online question and a comment for you? Sure. Yes, yeah, so there, uh, there's a person you, attending like? Asma, Asma Khalil, uh, and she requested Water Environment Forum uh, to collaborate with her because she uh, has She's working on similar kind of uh, domain. Uh, and she has also provided email in her chat. That is uh, the one comment. The, uh, there is one question uh, and it, it, it goes like, what actions are taken by local management for improving slash uh, rehabilitating the damage slash loss done to deltas for, um, of, a of uh, their areas other than support of the government? Uh, basically, he is interested to know about the uh, kind of other uh, actions being taken other than the government. 
And uh, there is also a hand raised by um, Ali Jabir Malik, uh, who is a journalist in Pakistan. Um, uh, Mariam, can we take the three sort of comments and questions and ask, um, starting with uh, Senator, followed by Tan, um, and um, followed by Diana, like just some um, reflections from them, and then we'll do another cycle. And, and maybe, maybe Ali, and three men, yeah. maybe Ali first. He had his hand. Ali up. first, but that will give and us four questions. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah. oh, I see. Let's do three questions, okay. and then Ali, I'll ask you to just hold on a little bit, and then we'll do another three questions so they can reflect way yeah. better. Senator, you can go first, and then Freeman, Tan, and Diana in that order. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Senator Nisa, are you there? Okay, thank you very much. I think it was the one thing which came out very openly, very clearly, is that there's a lot of commonality and this is exactly what I also said. So therefore, I think we need to cooperate. And I think Asim and uh, Freeman, this is really a great opportunity for all us all. And we saw some of the good presentations from Mekong and uh, Delta and from Vietnam also. And these are the basics which we can build up and all the questions. And just like Asma has contacted, uh, we'll be very happy to share uh, the future course with them. And in so far as the government is concerned, I think governments of federation, that is Pakistan government, as well as the Sin government, where the Delta is, they are doing a lot of work, like their postal authorities and their uh, various institutions they're working. And I'm very happy to, in future, share those with you. But in addition to the government, I must mention that there are two uh, uh, international NGOs who are operating in Pakistan, and they both have done a tremendous job in the Delta, particularly for the mangrove preservation and replanting. And they are WWF as well as IUCN. I think they were invited, but uh, some of the other, they did not seem to be there. And there are a number of movies that they have prepared and number of issues that they have brought in and they are regularly meeting. So I think we must link up. And this is where I said stockholders, not only the country. And as I said that first we have met the Delta stock stakeholders and some of the friends that you already have heard. But after this, we are going to move to the Sindh level that is in the province where it is there where we are going to have invite all these stakeholders. For example, there are four districts which are affected uh, by the Indus Delta. And they are, number one is Tata, where you are heard today. Number two is Badin. Number three is Sujawal. Number four, not in, in Karachi. Uh, not in the same sequence. And there are a lot of chamber, there are a lot of private uh, sector working on it. And I think we'll bring them all together. And this is where I think we'll be uh, in Karachi, and that will be in English, unlike the one we had in Tata, which was in local Sindhi language. So in English, and I think we'll invite all, and this will be a good preparation we'll be doing. And I think we will induct, and my suggestion is that we should include all the things we have said into the con convention. And this is what Asim and Freeman will be doing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Nisa. Freeman, please go ahead. Uh, so you had been bombed out and you are back. Just some comments on the questions and comments that came from the floor. Um, I could try and summarize if you didn't hear the questions and comments, but please go ahead. Freeman. Yeah, please, can you just uh, highlight uh, the questions, please? Um, can, can you hear me? Yes. yes uh, an online participant asked that uh, what actions are taken by local management for improving or rehabilitating the damage loss done to deltas of their areas other than the support of the government? 
Yes, and a comment around um, migration for survival, if you have the, that phenomena in, in the Niger Delta. And lastly was a comment, um, someone asked the comment and I, I don't remember quite the, all the details, but maybe just your thoughts on those two. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So thank you very much. So in a quick response to uh, talking about um, survivor migration, first of all, we should understand that uh, Delta areas are resource-rich ecosystems. And anywhere you have natural resources, whether water, or you're talking about biodiversity, for example, we have communities, local and indigenous people who depend largely on these resources for survival. So if you have things like flooding or you have things like extractive activities or maybe destructions or pollution that takes away maybe biodiversity, we have people who depend on the fisheries we have people who look at the water for processing of food. We, need pe we have people also who farm around. So the resource or the survival of local communities depend on resources, natural resources, and which is the reason they have things like the tragedy of the common, whereby nobody classify ownership, and which is why water is being defined recently to say, let's commodify water. So when you deprive people who depend on these resources for their survival through damages or pollution, they have to leave because they can't die. Nobody wants to stay alive to die. So you have to leave where you are to see how you can survive. So they migrate from where these resources are, but be compromised to areas they can survive. So which is why we said migration for survival. Then when we talked about loss of livelihood. If I'm a fisherman and um, I can no longer fish, I can no longer catch fish or I have to go to the sea, high sea and the facility I have can't take me there. I have lost my livelihood for survival. Alternative is usually not there. If I'm a farmer and it's been polluted, I cannot. So this is where we say livelihood losses also occur. So these are the interface of things that are happening between local communities, natural resources, and biodiversity losses. So I don't know, and this is what result to a lot of community moving from, not just from rural to urban areas, but moving from rural to urban, or movement for survival, which I earlier said. Then when you have things like flooding, it takes away their home. Recently in Libya, just last week, we heard about a dam that was opened in Libya keep more than 1,000 1, persons in a go, and the damages up to now is unquantifiable. So these are things that Delta Unite, UNCC, ROD, the new convention is going to address. So we are looking forward to see all those who are going to be interested to sign up and to see how we can start addressing some of the climate change induced challenges in our deltas globally. Thank you. Thank you, Freeman. Um, I think the next person is Tan. If you can also comment on the other question around um, what else are communities uh, engaging in besides just looking uh, for gov governmental interventions and mechanism? What other, um, uh, what can you highlight that's happening on the ground? Thank you, Tan. Go ahead. Okay, thank you for uh, raising this question. Uh, I can share with you the, some uh, experience from Vietnam uh, dealing with what we call a residential cluster for certain group of people who are exposed to the flood risk during the, the flood, uh, flood season. Uh, initially, the government uh, planned to uh, settle uh, certain residential cluster away from this uh, flood uh, prone and uh, uh, with the expectation with the, the, when they are moved to the new uh, area where they can be uh, this uh, uh from the, the area where they used to work and 
uh, it believed that uh, by by doing this this way that they reduce uh, the exposure to the risk. But uh, uh, it is quite important to uh, realize that uh, when they move uh, people away from where they make a living, it is uh, very uh, costly and it's a great, great, uh, major implication of their survival. That's why the, in most of the residential cluster, uh, the the success of is quite low because people uh, tend to uh, come back to the area where they used to live. And uh, it's showing that uh, uh, when you're talking about the relocating the people, you have to took the, to take it in, into account uh, how can they make a living while uh, while they are uh, living uh, we are they are moved to the uh, totally different uh, uh, ecological uh, or, or, or surrounding environment is is uh, uh, far far not similar to what they uh, used to work in. Uh, the, therefore. Uh, uh, we recommend that uh, it is more wise that uh, to uh, to build up the the local community to to develop their own uh, coping uh, strategy uh, by uh, in, uh, uh, introducing uh, some different uh, some different soft uh, measurement uh, such as uh, to build uh, the the capacity of the household uh, the how the house uh, the, the farmer to raise the the the, the, the house uh, in at a different level that we call the when the the water plant they when can uh, stay in the same level, but they just uh, leave the the, la the the level of the house. So uh, by doing that, uh, they can still uh, uh, stay in this place, but uh, reduce the the the, the risk. But uh, they can still make a living. So that is something that we we have to think uh, in the relationships of uh, resettlement and uh, how can they uh, how can they uh, make sure that they can get access to. Uh, Water to make the, the living. So that is something that uh, I just like to share with you the experience from uh, Make of Delta. Thank you. Thank you, Tan. Uh, Diana, if you can respond, um, and then I will hand over to Mariam to do the next three sort of rounds of questions and comments because they are all online. Diana, you are the last one to go. I know you don't have your two uh, <laughs> students <laughs> to speak maybe more on the question around what else is um, happening in terms of community engagement and community um, sort of governance and so on. Um, but you can comment also on the uh, migration issues and even on that question. And you, you promised last time to be fast, so I trust you can be. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so very quickly, um, yes, I don't, I don't have much to focus on, so I don't want to get overly specific about uh, the projects in other communities um, of which I am not personally a part of. However, I do know that um, within the context of St. Lawrence, there are several um, nonprofit organizations that are working with communities to be able to do resilience work, but is often not attached to government work projects, which in some ways can be great because obviously that means that the community voices are being sustained through local organizations, which is a fantastic thing, but it often means that they don't have like scaling up capacity, which is, is an issue obviously, um, and not always sustainable capacity for funding. Um, there are also uh, accelerated programs um, that come from private industry for communities that, again, have a sort of a sustainability issue. So like communities can work project uh, pilot projects, but they don't necessarily have avenues for a sustainable long term um, solutions or preventative projects. Uh, and then quickly on the migration issue. One of the biggest uh, issues facing, again, uh, as I mentioned before, because we have three ocean oceans surrounding um, Canada, is is immigration into our centers, and also, much like in the United States, we're seeing droughts towards the center of the country, right? So we have like flooding on the outside, drought in the center, and then people are going to be coming in. And due to the the climatic nature of Canada and and the cold, uh, housing costs are incredibly expensive, um, and building homes are very expensive because you cannot have a home that doesn't have basements. You ha can't have a home that doesn't have fully in uh, insulation that is fully connected to heating to get through winters. And so as folks move in, it's not simply just a question of migration to areas that may lack water and may have drought and also have a precarity when it comes to agriculture, but also just the building of homes is very, very costly. And that increases uh, income insecurity, housing insecurity, and folks will be left in, in situations where it will be very hard for them to cope. And I will leave it there.
Um, Lila, you are mu you were muted. Yeah, I was saying, uh, please go ahead and moderate the next set of questions. Uh, but remember to start off with uh, Ali Jabe Malik because he had his hand for up for a long time. Thank you. Um, I also have a comment. Uh, so, to hello, everyone. Ali uh, Jabir, it's uh, you can ask your question now. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes. So uh, it was really, really, uh, you know, a learning experience to be part of this uh, session. Uh, my question was part uh, particular to study uh, all these deltas in unison. I, I mean, the crisis would are the same. The people, uh, the problems they face during the shrinking of deltas are the same, but we never see any kind of research co collaboration between these regions to, to study the crisis in one picture and to derive uh, commonalities among the communities for you know shared and unified efforts. And one thing I want to comment is that Mariam has done a, a very, you know, uh, landmark uh, research on, on climate migration in Pakistan. That research was an eye-opener. From that research, it came to my mind that why uh, can't the, all these our associations of the deltas should join their heads together to, to bring, uh, to just find the opportunities from this crisis? Uh, because I, I didn't find any kind of such research. And if there is, please kindly mention on that. And, if, is, and it, is it possible that we study these deltas not uh, as the crisis in unison, but the problems and their solutions. So that without, with less capital, with less finances, because climate finance will remain an issue for the next, might be a decade or more. But in that crisis scenario, we should be prepared for some out of the box solutions and measures where we can you know, support communities and build resilience of those communities to fight back this disaster with the least available resources we had. Your comments on that, please. It's a general question. Anyone can answer. Um, Marie, can I? Yeah. All right. So very quickly, I think that uh, uh, I see that uh, three men have also described the issue of like issues of conflicts across factors. And my response to Ali's question is very quickly that you know that's that's one of the reasons that we're bringing together all the data under this UN umbrella for this for a convention so that we could. Uh, exchange and generate more systematic research, but not only research, policy and governance solutions, uh, about which we'll be talking about uh, specifically on October 20th. And there's a science panel coming on at 1055 today that will talk about the scientific research that's going on across the deltas. But we still feel that there's a lot of research that needs to happen. But my question to the panelists is about the conflicts. If you could share a little bit more about uh, like what type of conflicts have you seen and, and, and what are going on in terms of like the, the conflicts in delta regions, for example, at least in Indus Basin, I know that there's been a conflict uh, going on between ethnic, uh, like ethnic communities, the settlers and the migrants in terms of Muhajirs versus Sindhis versus fishermen and all kinds of challenges. And I, and I think similar challenges are there in Niger as well uh, between the, the, the people who are grazing their animals versus the people who are farmers or settlers. So I was wondering like if there are any comments about conflicts uh, and what type of conflicts are you seeing? Because this is a critical issue that we need to bring up. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, is it possible for me to add to what Asima said, please? Yes, please. Yeah. And I think then I see the Senator Mehman have raised the hand. So, yeah. And we have we are short on time. We have about four minutes. So you can okay, share. Just 30 seconds. If it's okay, no problem. It's fine. If we don't have time, no problems. No, no, please, please go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Okay, fine. I, I think he respond to him. I think he asked a very, very critical question so we need to really understand. So there is something we found that, you know, the, the science community has not actually done enough when it comes to researches across our Delta because the Delta issues are enormous. So first of all, we need to start coordinating even from the science angle. Now, if you look at the map of the world with Deltas, you will see that the big countries, the, 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 the G7 countries have their Delta well put together and Asia, for example, Vietnam, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Then in Africa, for example, and the others, you say other deltas. So it shows that the knowledge to city is still very low. So we need to deliberately, this is where 
the academic community has to step in. You know, for example, we went to Senegal last month. We discovered that there were issues that concerns Mariam, I think we lost you. It looks like we 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 have lost connection with uh, Freeman. So maybe we can uh, take question from Senator Nassar Mehman. I think he was going to respond. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have no question, but I have comments, additional comments. I think Asim talked about the ethnic problems that may be there in the Indus Delta. Uh, let me reflect on it. Right now, when we look at the TT Bandar, which is at the Indus Delta in Tata district, one has seen that when it comes to the effect, the migration takes place, it is of the local people which generally will take place. However, this uh, there has been no conflict that one has observed because I've seen uh, people, even Pathans uh, working in the Delta, and I have seen Balochis are working there. I have seen some of the Mahajis working. And there are absolutely no conflict. They work together. And if they have to move out of the delta, they move together. However, in terms of the migration, one has seen when the restoration of the mangroves have taken place with the help of the <clears throat> WWF and IUCN and the government of Sin, where they replanted a lot of uh, mangroves, then the locals and others have stayed on and used the opportunity to grow the fishes and catch the fishes. And they've even been saying that how they've inc increased the income and the livelihood. So I would say these two aspects are being addressed collectively there. Thank you. Is it Freeman? Freeman, did you join us? I think Wakaday also. Yes, okay. I'm here. Sorry, my internet. Okay, but briefly, yeah. please speak to us. Yeah, I'm fine. Okay, so um, what I was trying to say the other time is just to highlight the need for us to see how best to start coordinations and how we can actually start addressing the issues that concerns, especially local community people, because some of these issues are already obvious. But where we have problems is um, if you have a Delta and you want to address the issues of your Delta alone, you cannot, for example, approach the UN and also, for example, the, the, the UNESCO, for example, to say we have to do a heritage preservation. So we now have a more coordinated front where we can start speaking to all these issues. And where you have the diversity of countries and community people, we can start finding solution to our problems. So we shouldn't neglect the interface of citizen science where local people and local community can add to knowledge. So if you want to do a good science, a good documentation, we need local, local people knowledge with the science knowledge. And this is where we can make some good input. And this kind of coordination is what we are bringing to the United Nations that got us to where we are with this approval. So we need to work more together in a more coordinated for no more in silos to move this convention forward. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, uh we had hoped to hear from one more speaker, but I, I think we should go to our break and give everyone a chance to stretch their legs. Um, so uh, the local time is about a quarter to the hour, about 15 minutes to the hour, and we'd like to come back at five minutes to the hour, which for New York City time zone will be 10.55 uh, a.m. It should be 7.55 p.m. in Pakistan and maybe 9.55 p.m. in Vietnam. But anyway, at five minutes to the hour, we'd like to see you back here. Uh, we will uh, then have some speakers, uh, the science voices part of our panel, and then uh, a closing summary and synthesis. Uh, so we hope to see you back here soon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Everyone. All right, so Kevin, I will just give a brief introduction. Uh, Kevin, I'm really uh, delighted to like start the science panel. Um, we have uh, our speakers, um, Professor Kevin Shu is gonna start. Um, uh, he's an 
Director at the Coastal Studies Institute and Professor in the Department of Oceanography and Coastal Studies in Louisiana State University. And uh, Professor Hsu is also part of our planning committee for the UN Convention. Um, and I'm really looking forward to this discussion uh, and the overview from Professor Hsu. And then we will follow up uh, with uh, Professor Sial from Sindh Agricultural University. And hopefully one of our collaborators from um, uh, Vietnam would also be joining afterwards. Um, and if they're not there, but I would also like to recognize uh, uh, Gordy, our collaborator from Congo Basin. Uh, he was traveling, so he will, will give him the floor a little bit after this um, as part of it to bring up the voices from the, uh, the Congo Basin as well. So with that, Professor Shu, the floor is yours. Uh, please take it away. Great. Uh, can you see my shared screen and the laser? Yes, yes. that laser is good. Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, hello everyone. My name is Kevin Xu. I'm a professor from Louisiana State University. It's a pleasure to share with you some current status about the Mississippi Delta in the United States. So a little bit background information. This is the latest uh, sea level prediction from IPCC, so I believe all of us already know what is IPCC. We have been doing many different kinds of predictions. Hundreds of scientists work on a report. And the latest version is the sixth assessment report. And on this diagram, black is the observed sea level rise. And the color lines are actually the future sea level situation under different kinds of scenarios. I would like to draw your attention to the slope of the curve. Uh, over the past 100 year, sea level has been rising, but in the next century, sea level will rise at a much faster rate. There's also a very um, unique situation for ice sheet instability. So if there's any ice sheet collapse in Arctic, Greenland, Antarctic, uh, it will trigger catastrophic sea level rise, which is this dashed line. It's rare, but if it occurs, it will cause lots of problem to the global deltas. Now here, I would like to borrow a figure published in 2014. On this diagram, if we do a comparison of what's available from the global river deltas um, and what is needed to maintain the global deltas, you can actually see that many of those uh, global deltas are actually under risk. If the deltas are under this red line, that means those deltas do not have enough sediment to keep up with rising sea level. Of course, Mekong, Mississippi, Amazon, Niger, <clears throat> and many other deltas are in this region. But keep in mind, this paper was published in 2014 using some older sea level rising rate. If we use the new 2023 uh, sea level rising rate, more deltas will be under the risk. So let's take a look at the situation in the United States. So in United States, uh, based on this diagram, you can actually see that we have major shoreline change and land loss in the Gulf Coast, many areas in the East Coast, Great Lake area, Alaska. So the West Coast is relatively stable. If you look into the Northern Gulf, Mexico, Louisiana, which is in this area, nearly everywhere is in a land loss crisis. So this is the famous red map generated by US Geological Survey. On this map, if you look at the land change from 1932 to 2000, over a 70-year period of time, everywhere in red indicate land loss. We only have a little bit of land gain in a few small deltas. So what's going to happen in the future? Uh, Bloom and Roberts published a paper on nature geoscience. They predict the situation in 2100. So here is New Orleans. Mississippi Delta is totally inundated. Baton Rouge is where I am. Um, so LSU is actually a flagship university in Baton Rouge. Mm -hmm. So as you can tell, 
the entire southeastern part of Louisiana will be underwater in 2100. And this is a huge threat to the entire the coast of the Miss, uh, Louisiana. So what we are, what, so what is the solution? So um, in Louisiana, we actually have a government agency called Coastal Protection Restoration Authority, CPRA. Every five to six years, CPRA prepare a master plan for a sustainable coast. So this is a very ambitious plan. It's a 50 year, $50 billion plan to try to uh, manage all kinds of projects, try to save our coast. So basically every year we will need to figure out where we can get $1 billion um, and then try to use them on coastal protection restoration project. So what kind of projects are listed in the master plan? So here I have a long list. Uh, they are mainly related to coastal restoration. For example, we have marsh creation project, sediment diversion project, oyster reef restoration, barrier island maintenance, among others. <clears throat> so here I have a map. It's a very nice 3D view of the coastal system. Again, New Orleans is here. Baton Rouge is where I am. The birth delta is in the southeast. Everywhere in green indicated some areas in which we will have marsh creation. So basically, we dig sediment from somewhere, dump them to a target area to build a higher elevation on top of which grass can grow. And we also have diverting project in red, among many, many others. So if you look at the project, they are actually in a huge skill. Uh, it's a very complex system. Right over here, this is the called the so-called mid-barrier sediment diverting project. And this single project cost about three billion US dollars to finish. So the idea is to divert the water and sediment from the Mississippi River to the receiving basin to build a new land. So what can we do, right? So I believe that community voice and community participation is the highest priority. So we will have to engage the local community. Uh, I would encourage everyone to spread the word about the sea level rise and climate change. I also encourage the community to engage in the early stage, especially the planning process. So every five to six years, we have a new plan. And we have lots of meetings, workshops in Louisiana. <clears throat> so I encourage everyone to participate in the workshops and meetings. And also, um, I would encourage people to think about uh, the human uh, immigration uh, or migration and pre be prepared for the changing coastal environment. Because sooner or later, we will have to talk about the retreat and we will need to figure out where we need to move to and how we move to there. Lastly, I would like to talk about the Mega Delta program. So uh, right now we are talking about the Delta Unite Convention, um, but I'm not sure if you know this, and this is like the science counterpart under UN. So under the UN decades of ocean science for sustainability development, uh, there's actually one program called Mega Delta Program. So in the November 2023, there will be a Mega Delta meeting, and there will be lots of scientists from all around the world talking about uh, different topics, including erosion, flooding, hazard, uh, restoration, and many other things. So if you are interested, I would encourage you to uh, register in this um, meeting. I will be going to this meeting. So I will also, during that meeting, if I have a chance, I will also talk about uh, what's going on in this Delta United Convention, because I believe that under the large umbrella of UN initiative, we have uh, we have Delta Unite, which is mainly on the social, uh, economical, and uh, uh, decision-making side but we also have a mega delta program, which is mainly on the natural science side. That's all from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin, for 
very insightful uh, comment and then bringing this uh, different parts of the UN into this picture. And of course, you know, like we, we need to coordinate across different UN programs. We're moving forward on this. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll wait for questions um, after a uh, few more speakers in the science panel. Uh, so Kevin, please stay tuned. Uh, there will be some discussion coming up. So let's start with uh, Professor Altaf Sial uh, from Sindh Agricultural University, Tondo Jam. Uh, Professor Sial, would you be sharing your, uh, would you be presenting or are you going to just talk about the question? No, I, I'm not going to share. Uh, I haven't prepared the, any presentation because of the time constraint. Uh, it was uh, asked us that it should be three to five minutes. So I didn't prepare any presentation. So I will talk about the Indus Delta. Thank you, Asim sir. Please. So, Professor Sial, I've already shared the questions. Please go ahead and, uh, you know, like talk about the state of science in Indus Delta and really appreciate looking forward okay. to hearing your perspective. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, thank you, uh, the United Con uh, Conservation River Delta, for inviting me to present the Indus Delta at this uh, prestigious forum. Indus Delta is actually the fifth largest delta in the world and has the largest mangrove uh, for, for, uh, forest for the arid region. So arid in arid region, if we consider the arid region, so Indus Delta has the largest mangrove forests. But that delta is going towards the uh, dying. The diminishing river flows have affected the Indus Delta a lot. There are many issues which are being faced by the Indus Delta. I will just talk about the issues and then how can we tackle those issues and what our communities can play the role in that one. The, if there, there was one question, what are the key stakeholders in, 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 in our Delta? So first of all is the government of Pakistan and then government, provincial government, local communities, fishermen and fisher industry, scientists and researchers, NGOs, tourism industry, international organizations. So these all are the stakeholders for the Indus Delta. The issues which uh, Indus Delta is nowadays is facing, one of the main issues is the unavailability of fresh water. The Indus Delta used to receive huge quantum of the fresh water before 1930s. With the growing population, the government started constructing the hydraulic structures on the river Indus and its tributaries. So the water was 80% of water is now being diverted for the agricultural purpose for domestic purposes resulting in there is a huge decrease in the river flows to the Indus Delta. Certainly it has affected the aquatic life, biodiversity and environment of the Indus Delta. Another issue is the sea level rise. It's a global phenomena, but it affects more at the Indus Delta because Indus Delta is a flat and 80% of Indus Delta is has the elevation up to five meters. So slight rise in sea level affects huge to the Delta. And this sea level rise is accompanied with the land subsidence. We always talk about the sea level rise, but land subsidence is in this in the South Asia and the East Asia is a big issue. Recently, a paper was published and, and it shows that there are few areas which are more thinking and Indus Delta is one of them. So this synergic impact of sea level rise and land subsidence sh uh, shows us that in near future, the Delta will be submerged. If the river flows are not improved or the required water is not given to the Indus Delta. The delta was said to be spread up to 13,000 square kilometers 100 years ago. Now it has shrunk to only 1,000 square hectares. The active delta, I'm talking about the active delta. 
so there is a huge decrease in the delta because of the the the, the again i'll say the unavailability of the fresh water the another issue which uh, delta faces is the surface and subsurface sea water intrusion people think about the surface sea water intrusion and they think that's the intrusion because they they see it physically but the subsurface sea water intrusion goes into miles and miles into land world and it has impacted the coastal aquifers the water quality has deteriorated and people are unable to extract water and to use that fresh water aquifers which were a uh, uh, few years a few uh, uh, decades ago they, those were fresh aquifers now they have converted into saline because of the subsurface sea water intrusion of course the climate change is a big issue since uh, river delta is at the tail end of this uh, indus basin system and indus basin, uh, basin system uh, can, can mostly contains the four countries india china uh, the pakistan and uh, afghanistan so this whole surface water comp has to pass through the the, the sand and and it has to carry through the river indus but the due to climate change sometimes the water availability for even drinking purpose is not available and people they face a huge challenge for the available for drinking purpose it has impacted the agricultural land and uh, the, the 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 due to this one the world bank has reported that due to degradation of the indus delta 2 billion rupee uh, 2 billion dollars is their loss to pakistan because of degradation of the indus delta this is a huge loss due to degradation of the indus delta the soil salinity and water logging is another issue and because of all these issues the people have been compelled to migrate from the delta delta region there is a huge migration in search of livelihood in search of the, their life because these areas are more vulnerable to the cyclones you know that this year a uh, viper joy uh, cyclone was coming towards this the the synth coast the the pakistan coast and there was a huge migration because of that the, the, the cyclone and the people this they, they feel that it's not safe and it's most vulnerable it's the most flat area so they have migrated and and they they are not now not moving to back to, to their their villages because of the, the the risk of their lives and also the unavailability livelihood and, and due to the degradation of, of the delta moreover the the industries especially the sugar industry they are dumping their wastewater directly without treating the the, the, the wastewater directly into the indus delta and that has impacted not only the aquatic life uh, the other aquatic life but also it has impacted some areas with the mangroves as well so it it has a direct impact on the the livelihood of the people and they are complaining it now what we we can do i suggest that this issue these issues are of interest that require a multidisciplinary approach that integrates environmental sustainability social equity and economic development so participatory approaches need to be adopted for effective sustainable solutions inclusive governance structures that involve marginalized and vulnerable groups can help address social inequalities and promote co cooperation and uh, at the end just i would say that sometimes donor agencies are the the loan agencies they prepare their projects without considering the indigenous knowledge indigenous uh, skills they just prepare uh, their their projects while sitting thousands of uh, miles away and they don't know the ground realities and those projects most of the time they fail to achieve the targets so i would at this forum i would request to those uh, the, the loan agencies the donor agencies that please include the indigenous knowledge indigenous skills while development of their projects for the delta especially for the indus delta thank you very much professor Tia, this is great thank you so much for uh, bringing out the issues of community empowerment and the role of communities in uh, engaging in 
uh, figuring out these integrated solutions. So thank you so much for a very comprehensive overview of the interspacing. Um, I will uh, give now floor to Gody Godar from uh, Congo Basin uh, to say a few words about the Congo Basin challenges uh, that are being faced. So Gody, floor is yours. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you, Sarah, so much. And uh, uh, I don't have uh, any uh, debt collections uh, data in the, base, in the Congo Basin River, uh, but I can relate it to uh, the community and uh, the work I'm doing there in the Democratic Republic of Congo. I was born and raised there and I moved to the United States 20 uh, years old. I uh, lived there, here in the States uh, over 35 years already. But uh, I am a founder of an organization called Go Cancer Society, which is uh, empowering the local people and, and protecting the ancestral land right. Uh, Congo Basin is, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, the uh, rainforest there is, is the second uh, largest wind uh, forest to second to the Amazon. So it is a very, very vital to our climate. And uh, when I left uh, 30 years ago, when I started working with my program on a region where I was born, specifically is uh, right in the, in the middle of uh, Africa, uh, where equator cross. So I'm a, uh, uh, Laktumba is a uh, 200, uh, uh, 120 kilometers uh, south of equator. So uh, I would like to share a little bit uh, because uh, to bring up uh, the uh, conversations of the uh, Congo uh, river um, uh, to a scientific uh, uh, approach and uh, uh, in, a, in a way is uh, really trying to tap on and really to find out what's, what's really uh, the effect is, is happening there because the uh, Congo River is, is the feeds all the, the uh, uh, measures, the uh, uh, lakes, and it uh, goes to Latumba as well, and uh, through to swamp lands. It goes uh, through to the uh, uh, deep in the jungle, and uh, uh, they call also the, the Couvette, uh, Couvette Centra, uh, as well as also the, the peat land. Uh, which is the, like a, the, the uh, number one carbon sink on, on Earth as we're speaking now. It's in that area. So uh, and, and as uh, to uh, the implementations of uh, working with the community, when we did, they started to bring a, a clean water initiatives, and I uh, have uh, some of the uh, water treatment uh, uh, testing kit from the University of North Carolina. We brought it there. The amount of a cholera from uh, all these uh, rivers, uh, even the Congo River itself, uh, even in the lake, you go in the in the swamp areas, it was just uh, unbearable. And I wonder why it really affected so much the community in a way because uh, uh, the terrible water uh, uh, water qualities and uh, of course water is uh, like essential. Uh, if you don't have a clean water, forget it. Uh, and the wildlife, biodiversity, the people, humans, and the plants, everything. And the, I, I'm, a, I'm a one. I wonder is that, uh, without the no really uh, data and the study in uh, that regions, uh, 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 the, the effect is uh, really tremendous in, in many ways. Uh, I, I see the last uh, few years. And I talked to the people in the tribal region. And they says uh, it was uh, several uh, floods and the massive rains uh, uh, came in. We are they live in the rainforest, but they never see this kind of rain before in that area. And 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 by I believe that by the effect of a sea level rising, it's also affecting uh, uh, Congo River and to rise as where the lakes rise. And it uh, uh, really uh, is in bringing in my village where I was born. It was uh, under the water the last uh, couple of years ago, twice in a row, which is uh, they never ever see that. So that is a really, really huge thing that to consider to bring a uh, uh, Congo Basin into the conversations. I believe this can be really a big uh, opportunity for global 
uh, communities in terms of uh, climate issues because that place is a, is a, it's a really uh, that that uh, forest it's a, it's a really uh, piece of the equations of uh, our, our climate issues. Uh, community, we're talking about the the things like a, 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 a um, environmental justice. Then, and then these people, if the floods start to come in with the uh, 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 targets, and they try my work pretty much there trying to protect these forests. So to eliminate it, the most um, the logging company to continue to log because that's also part of the creating a really uh, devastations. Like in capital city, uh, six months ago, it was a massive rains again, and, and uh, so much uh, uh, and erosions, and it, it created this uh, chaos. And we see that uh, throughout of uh, global uh, um, uh, communities, uh, these uh, things like, uh, this is the signs we are in a tipping point. If we're not really going to act, uh, 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 on this, uh, I, I mean, we, I don't know what we are thinking. We can sit here, talk all the time, but if we're not taking actions to uh, address these issues, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a, what are we gonna leave for our future generations? Is it, is it uh, what kind of humans we were created to really uh, uh, help each other community, our children, which we love, and what kind of planet we're gonna leave to them and with the, uh, all uh, the industry and, and just the pollutions and just the really bringing it. Uh, I, I wanted to see that. I wanted to be able to uh, have a, a, a trip and a partner uh, group which can work with the community, educate them in my regions and, and, and to find out what the issues are there if we really bring the uh, uh, scientific community to to bring uh, this uh, uh, Congo and my community uh, in conversations, so uh, uh, that can really shift the the notions uh, way of the government uh, uh, operate there. The, the, the cities, the facts, and the reality, the the, the impact is it's it's in there uh, unknown. Uh, it can be really really uh, big. Uh, um, uh, information to share globally. Uh, I, I think that's a, a, what I wanted to share about that uh, uh, right now. So I, I'm just looking for this opportunity, hopefully that something can be worked out uh, uh, and together here to tackle uh, what uh, uh, we are facing uh, uh, in, 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 in this beautiful planet that we live. Um, but uh, we, we, we need to do something. Need to do something to leave something for our future generation. Thank you for having me. I'm Gordy. Thank you so much for these very inspiring comments and uh, you know, the, the challenges bringing from uh, like uh, Central Africa from the from the Congo River Basin. Uh, we, are, we have the last uh, remaining stocks of very pristine uh, biodiversity and tropical systems that are also vulnerable to mining and all kinds of uh, drivers that are leading to problems downstream in the deltas as well. So, and, and yes. thank, thank you for bringing about issues of, uh, you know, the environmental justice and, and community empowerment in those regions. And that's been a running theme. So next I wanna uh, give very briefly floor to um, Inatami Peter, who has asked really an important question about the role of community science. And that's been part of our conversation. And that's also very part of an uh, important part of our convention and the approach that we are taking in the UNCCRD about uh, not, that, like delinking communities from the science, rather communities can do citizen science and community science approaches. Uh, so, Inadimi, you want to raise, you want to ask your question directly yourself, or should I read it? Uh, this is Inadimi Peter from Akasa. Okay, so maybe I can just read it. Uh, is the communities in Akasa are observing climate impact and trying to record their observations? Women, youth, and groups are being mobilized to see the need to act on these impacts to save that their habitat and sources of livelihoods. Students in primary and secondary schools are sanitized from climate change and record sea level rise and floodwaters. Community groups require capacity as community scientists 
to effectively record these observations that will be shared with government and other stakeholders to promote effective decision making to curb the effect of climate change. So, and uh, I think like given the interest of time, we have already heard from uh, Mekong Basin. So let's move on to the question and answer. And that's the first question uh, that Inadami Peter has asked. And I will uh, I request uh, um, uh, Professor Kevin Shu and Professor Sial, um, as well as uh, Professor Sin from, uh, uh, from Vietnam, um, and uh, to, to, to kind of like answer this question, and if, if Freeman or anyone else from the Niger Basin have any comments about the role of community science um, in addressing these challenges and, and, and answering some of the uncertainties that uh, the current science is unable to find um, the, the, the data for, right? So there are a lot of models, but the ground realities require the communities to be engaged in providing real-time data. So what is, the, what is the potential of community science um, and how we can integrate community science moving forward in the UN Convention. So that's the question that I'm posing as a as a way to start the question sessions. And we we please go through um, one by one. So uh, Kevin, you want to start first, and then Professor Sial, um, if you have any comments about this. Yeah, yeah, this is an excellent question. So I'm a natural scientist, but I collaborate with some social scientists. So for the Mississippi Delta, based on what I have learned, uh, many social scientists use a model called precipitary model. So basically it's like a conceptual model. Uh, when you try to address a coastal problem on the Delta in the very early stage, in the planning stage, um, scientists will need to engage local community get their input, and then uh, those input will be used in determining what will be the scientific question a natural scientists will study. And then there will be a, a, a cycle. So basically, uh, with those input, we generate some scientific predictions, right? So maybe in the next 10 years, this will be a land loss situation, this will be a sea level rise, and then we will deliver those new results to the community and ask them, what do you think about those kind of changes, right? Uh, are they accurate? Are they close to your perception? And they will provide a second round of uh, feedback, which can then be used. So this is called a participatory model. And there have been, um, there have been quite a few social scientists in Louisiana who use that model. And I think that's a very good model uh, to be used in many global deltas. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, uh, Professor Sial, you have any comments about the role of community science in in the in in addressing the problems in in the space and other deltas? Yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, science plays a vital role, and actually, when we plan to revive the delta. For the, the betterment of the Delta, for the community, science has a vital role in gathering the data. Unless we don't have the authentic data, we cannot uh, move forward and see the solutions. How can we uh, engage the communities and what damages are so far concerned? So in this con context, science has a vital role. Suppose uh, in, in, in this delta, it, it, it has been always debate that how much area has been taken out by, by the sea. So this we can have uh, provided evidence through scientific tools, through scientific knowledge. We use different models like uh, DSAS software, the, the GIS and remote sensing, global uh, uh, coastal dam, and based on these evidences, we can have the case of Delta. This Delta is not only being degraded, but it's taken away by the sea. So these evidences, that data, this all be, 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 can be gathered, can be modeled through the scientific knowledge, through the, the research, through the, 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 the research, and academy, research and academia. So there, there's a vital role. Another thing which I again repeat, which I already said that the indigenous knowledge plays a vital role 
for the industrial time because these people know even even we are conducting research but the people which are sitting there which are facing the the problems on daily basis they know even more than us so whenever decisions are taken these people must be con uh, uh, the communicated their opinion sh should be considered in scientific knowledge in scientific decisions so certainly the the, the scientific knowledge play the vital role now we have to to provide the evidence that how much water is needed nowadays i i believe that most of the delta of the world are facing the same issue of the diminishing the fresh water flows water are being diverted at the upstream the upper riparian is taking up for their agricultural purposes and certainly it the delta are facing the shortage of water and eventually the, the the delta the degrading they are shrinking this is a big issue and i think the all the scientists all the the, the people who are working on the delta must coordinate with each other that how to resolve this the main issue is the the, the dimension fresh water flows and we can we can uh, have the scientific evidence that how much how it impacts the 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 delta in terms of the 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 uh, the delta formation more more area will be uh, in uh, we have to move towards the sea or the sea is moving towards the landward so so that that the science provides the evidence so the the without the scientific evidence the case of delta we cannot put at the international forums so this the, the and also the the the, the, the local communities they they are the main stakeholders they sh should also be considered while uh, while planning about the the sustainability of the thank you very much thank you very much for bringing the issues of transboundary but also the role of communities critical role of communities in collecting the data i see in the uh, freeman has raised a hand so freeman please go and then after freeman i saw a comment from bill knight about the the, the role of new technologies in terms of empowering community science. So, uh, Freeman, you go, then uh, then Bill Knight, and then I will give voice to Lockho, who have joined. I, I know he did a systematic review and spoke earlier from Mekong Basin, but a couple of minutes for me, Lockho after uh, Bill after Knight. After we oh. lost your uh, voice. No, no, sorry, it's my speaker, my bad. Okay. All right. So, uh, Freeman, floor is yours. Okay. So, so thank you very much. Uh, sorry, my video is off, but my internet is fluctuating a little bit. So uh, I will actually would like to add uh, some words on that uh, community science and uh, citizen participation in uh, in um, academic studies. So the thing is, um, the science community gradually has to understand and realize that um, there are indigenous knowledge that resides in these communities that even the science, even in the world of studying a particular stretch for years, we might not understand because local people or indigenous people, they were born, they reside, they live, and most of them, sometimes they die there. So, for example, they understand when sea level rises, or certain changes occur in certain coastal environment. Without using equipment, they can tell you that come here tomorrow morning at 4 a 4 30 a.m. This water will get here. Go there 4 30 a.m. Truly, the water will get there. They will tell you, for example, this water changes the sedimentation you see. Is going to be this. so. So there are knowledge we need to start key in. If you're talking about delta study, whether it has to do with mangrove, whether it has to do with water, these are expensive academic studies and knowledge that sometimes we don't even have the adequate equipment, and sometimes we don't even know how these changes occur. If you give a master student, for example, to monitor a particular water body or environment, six months study at most. If you give it to a PhD student, 18 months or two years at most. But indigenous people have this local knowledge we need to hold on to. So which is why there is need for adequate collaboration between the academic community and these local people. 
so that when we are designing it, it becomes citizen participation in it. And the UN also has identified this. In October 2021, it was identified as the game-changing role. And it was a discussion we negotiated and we talked about. So it is high time we leave certain kind of verbose languages and see how we can simplify it, and which is why government sometimes do, do not translate academic researches into policies because the language of reporting it sometimes gets too technical for them. They don't understand. We need to summarize some of our research findings into just one page or half a page for them to understand how to run and how do we get this done. We need to go simple. We need to go straight to the point, leave some jargon, work with local community. So this is what I wanted to add. Thank you. Freeman, thank you so much for this excellent intervention and, and, and recommendation. I think this word is, is duly noted and we'll move forward on incorporating this as we move forward in, in terms of designing this. Bill, do you have anything to add uh, in addition to what you said on the chat? Sorry, yes. Um, I, I beg your pardon. Yeah, I've just wanted to stress the fact that in 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 the, in, the, in the last two or three decades, uh, things have changed dramatically in terms of communication in the most remote places. When I went to live in Nakasa in 1997, you had to send a message by canoe. Nowadays, I can talk to Rainus on the phone just like that, no problem at all. So it's it's possible to get you know real time communication of what's happening down in the field, on the front line, where the sea is rising uh, and elsewhere, obviously. Um, so um, I just think that there's uh, th this is something that we should explore further, try and develop uh, and to use more. Um, and this will be particularly useful uh, from the villagers' point of view, to, uh, from the community point of view, to get uh, real effective messages down from the scientists about what they should be doing, how they can do it so they can then take uh, act, you know, really good, um, well-informed community action. What we can, what can we learn from from other communities, from from other things that are going on? And I, I think that community is very important because um, there are so many people. There's such vast areas. Government can't do it all on its own. So the people must be really actively involved in the sort of participation that you guys have been talking about. And the other thing is, I don't think we can divorce this. From the fact that we know there are disasters on the way so it's not just a matter of preparing or uh, for, for, for adaptation or wh where we're going to move or or whatever but it also there's, there's disasters coming just as they came before two years ago 1.4 million people in the niger delta river system were displaced for a good couple of months or so thank you well, yeah thank you so much for reminding us that and in in this basin in 2011 20 million people were displaced, and then 2022, about 33 million people were displaced, right? So just in a span of 10 years, we got two 1,000-year uh, flood storms in the deltas, and so that's really like a challenge. So we, we heard from Indus and from Niger uh, at, the, at the front lines of this climate crisis. Um, we will go to Mekong Basin for the last two minutes, uh, and before then, uh, we go to the synthesis part. So, uh, Locke, you have anything to add based on your... A systematic review of the study from uh, of the role of science and community science uh, in Mekong Basin. Uh, okay, so uh, yes, I think thank you very much, uh, Professor Asim. A couple so, of minutes. Uh, yes, so I have only two minutes, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry. So I think uh, most of the colleagues have covered quite well, so I will make it very short. Uh, so in case of the Mekong, uh, with respect to the nature-based solutions, I think the farmers and I emphasize here again, other colleagues already said uh, that indigenous knowledge is very very important and they already actively adapted to it. I think the science uh, should approach in such a way that we are there to create the lessons learned, the best practices so that we can upscale uh, to all the deltas around the world through uh, initiatives like what we are doing right here, rather than just to go in from a top-down approach, uh, try to help them. So from my case, I see we, we are there to learn from them and curate the best practices so that other deltas can also benefit from the successful adaptations uh, rather than try into social called help rather than learn and curate the lessons is that my my first my two minutes thank you very much professor isa thank you so much right so i mean i'm gonna like hand over to um liza you want to introduce emma so yeah. that right so thank you 
Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm just gonna introduce Emma. Um, myself and Emma are in the same program. She's a PhD student here at the University of Vermont. Um, she's like a trailblazer for our program. She just recently defended her dissertation proposal. I look up to Emma and Emma, you can have the floor to do the synthesis of this event. So you better listen if I look up to her. <laughs> For the threat. <laughs> um, thank you, Liza, and thank you everyone for, for joining us today. Um, I think the idea of synthesizing an event um, really allows us to digest and capture um, the work that's been done over the course of the last three hours. Um, so thank you all for joining. I'm going to briefly recap um, what happened in the last three hours, and then I'll talk about some of the um, overlapping themes and ideas that arose that I think we can continue to build on as we develop this convention on the conservation of river deltas. Um, so we started hearing from Susan Scorbati from Bennington College and from Freeman about some of the large scale challenges that river deltas around the world are facing. Um, and we learned about the upcoming UN convention on the conservation of river deltas. Um, which will be launching at the upcoming UN Climate Conference, um, COP28 in Dubai in November. Um, and we welcomed partners here today, which included community and academic voices from the Indus, Niger, Mekong, Amazon, Congo, River Deltas, as well as representation from Canada and the St. Lawrence River Basin. Um, before we got started, we heard um, an overview of some of the key challenges that are paramount to the UN Convention on the Conservation of River Deltas. We heard from Asim about the highlands to oceans approach, some of the unique challenges facing the Indus River Basin, which I'll talk about in a moment, as well as some of the challenges to inland river deltas, including the Aral and the Dead Sea, um, as well as some challenges facing um, ocean facing deltas. Um, we then moved into the community voices panel where we heard from representatives um, in the Indus, the Mekong, um, and the Niger River Basins, and Diana from Canada. Um, and from a synthesis perspective, there are a lot of common challenges and common devastation that's being faced in these communities around the world. Some of them include, obviously, climate change is the umbrella challenge that is causing increasing devastation to all of these locations. Um, we heard across the board about both erosion and saline inclusion as major environmental challenges that are facing these parts of the world. Um, and then we heard a lot about the social challenges facing communities in river deltas. One that came up a lot was community displacement and migration, um, as well as some of the longer term philosophical challenges with respect to migration. Do people continue to try and recover and rebuild or do they relocate um, or move away and abandon their communities, which is a, a deep-seated cultural challenge. Um, we heard about challenges to river de deltas and the implications um, that flooding and increased water uh, movement had on food and agriculture, on households, and whether or not a household was able to retain its um, integrity. Um, we heard about the implications on economies like fisheries, um, we spoke briefly about the challenge of pollution and um, the implications of different chemicals. Um, and we also heard about governance challenges, particularly in Canada and the United States, although I think a lot of us know that there are very um, complex governance challenges in all of these transboundary river deltas um, and, and also conflicts across deltas, um, which is why we're grateful to have environmental peace building as a partner in this work. Um, we heard a lot about how the most vulnerable and marginalized communities in river deltas um, bear the brunt of the challenges that climate change is bringing about. This includes, we heard a lot about the challenges of women, um, of people experiencing poverty, and of indigenous communities who have built their livelihoods around um, environmental resources that are currently in danger. Um, but for me, one of the most inspiring elements of this entire talk was what we heard about the solutions that local communities have generated in response to the challenges facing river deltas. Um, we heard from Freeman that the objective of the UN Convention on the Conservation of River Deltas gives local people a similar voice to governments 
and the UN, and we're trying to amplify these perspectives. Um, when we heard from the folks in the Niger River Basin, we learned about the value of education and storytelling for advancing solutions. Um, and we had a lot to learn from the folks in the Mekong and their adaptive approaches to flooding and reframing flooding as a gift from Mother Nature. I thought that was really interesting. We heard about work on dikes and adaptation measures that help reduce flooding um, and maintain the productivity of agriculture um, and other community-based adaptation measures for learning to live with and without floods. Um, we also learned about resources for communities via public-private partnerships, um, and we heard about the need for support for community scientists who may lack capacity. Um, and a common theme during our Community Voices panel was also that diverse voices contribute to more effective solutions, and you can't approach the UN alone. So how do we amplify um, and coordinate these diverse perspectives to build comprehensive solutions? Um, we then heard about scientific research happening in this same realm. Um, a lot of the scientific projections just validate what we heard from communities um, earlier in the day. Um, and Kevin Chu from Louisiana discussed how we can increase multi-scalar engagement and think about creative ways um, both to be involved in communities and to navigate change. Um, and we heard from him as well about the Mega Delta program, which is a scientific counterpart to the UN work that's happening that deals with issues related to hazards, resources, adaptations, and community solutions. Um, we heard from Professor Sial about the need for multidisciplinary approaches, which I think is something that we're all quite invested in here with this work. And we heard from Godi Godar about um, a call to action to avoid the tipping points um, and the need to do something and achieve environmental justice and environmental empowerment approaches. Um, and then our final conversation was about the role of community science. How do we get real-time data from communities and how do we integrate community science into our UN convention? We heard about um, participatory models of research and how we can utilize community engagement and community perspectives in um, our planning and research studies. Um, and we also heard a lot about the importance of indigenous knowledge and how to capture these longstanding relationships in a way that doesn't uh, live the length of an academic study, which might be six or 12 months, but rather an ongoing partnership with communities to make sure that their perspectives are central to any kind of planning that happens. Um, we heard briefly about the role of information technology as a mechanism for amplifying community science um, and how cell phones might be useful for that. Um, and we learned about nature-based solutions and the way local and indigenous nature-based knowledge is important as we develop these types of solutions. Um, so all in all, I think there were very creative solutions brought to the table today, but at the end of the day, we also share so many features, um, both environmentally and from a community perspective on what's wrong and what's difficult in these basins and what's going right. Um, I think it was really enlightening for me to hear these diverse perspectives from both the community and academia because it really validates our approach. Um, and I think while it's novel, it's very hard to debate um, making sure that everyone's at the table as we develop solutions to some of these more pressing problems. So I'm excited to see where this goes. I'm excited for our next gathering in October. Um, and I think I'll pass it over to Susan to close us out. Thank you. Thank you. So I wanna, in closing, uh, thank everyone who participated today, all of our speakers, uh, the wisdom, the knowledge, the experience that you've all brought. I think we've really all learned a lot. And uh, we, we just thank you so much. We know that we only represent a small group of people from all of the people around the world that are experiencing our issues right now in the deltas. And we hope to be gathering and building more capacity as we move forward. Uh, in support of the United Nations Conservation <clears throat> Convention on Conserving the River Deltas. Uh, the one thing I think I would leave us with is that we all, you know, scientists, communities, government agencies, um, 
all the different water managers, we all do work very, very hard in our own uh, areas to try to achieve what we know are, we need to, to go forward with these serious, serious problems. But I think what we have the opportunity to do now, and I, I think Freeman brought this up uh, with this convention, is that we can all come together. It's not that often that all of these groups, indigenous peoples, local communities, youth, women, scientists, water managers, academics, if we can connect together and really figure out a way, which is very, very difficult to build this capacity, um, to get this, and as you know, we, we heard this communication is possible now all around the planet, we really have an opportunity to make an impact. I think we all uh, sometimes don't feel that we can make this work because the problems are so serious, but I, I truly believe that with this group of people that are so smart and have so much experience, if we can work together, we actually may be able to, to, to get some very serious solutions that will get to our local communities all around the world. So in closing, I would just like to thank the Environmental Peace Building Association for sponsoring this. And to also remember that you can go to hashtag Deltas Unite to find out more information. Uh, there will be a recording of this and to please join us again on October 20th, where we will do, be doing a session that will focus mainly on governance um, policy and science issues. So thanks again, and we will stay in touch with everybody and keep everybody connected by our communications. Thank you.